If we were to look at ourselves through the lens of an experiment, like we would an animal experiment, we think that animal is sick. If you saw an animal digging in the corner, looking, 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 looking for a bone, the dog is looking, 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 and you'd think that's really sad. That's us, right? That's us. I'm pointing at myself intentionally. That's us. Dr. Andrew Huberman, welcome to the show. Great to be here. It's been a long time coming. Very long time coming. What do you mean when you say you cannot control the mind with the mind? Yeah, that statement really emerges from the fact that if we are in a pretty relaxed state or if we are happy, we generally feel like we can do what we want to do. We can maneuver through our environment. We can make choices that are reasonable. But oftentimes we're not in relaxed and happy states. That's just part of the human experience, obviously. And there is a fundamental feature to the nervous system, which is this thing they call the autonomic nervous system, which is just fancy nerd speak for the components of your nervous system that raise your levels of alertness or bring them way down. Sometimes we hear fight or flight, rest and digest, but this system governs all that, but a lot more. And basically what happens is when we are at the extremes of the autonomic, what I call seesaw, of very, very alert to the point of being really stressed or panicked or concerned, or if we are very close to sleep and we're drowsy and we're exhausted. At those points along the autonomic nervous system, our thoughts become a bit like a runaway train. You know, if you're very upset, it's hard to talk yourself out of it. If you're stressed, it's hard to think yourself out of it. In fact, you can start doing all sorts of third personing and rationalization. You can call someone, you can text somebody. It's very hard to get yourself out of those states with thinking alone. But the beauty of the autonomic nervous system is that it traverses the brain and the body and it connects to essentially all the organs of the body. And it's a two-way street such that certain behaviors, even certain patterns of breathing, et cetera, allow us to shift where we are on the autonomic continuum between very, very alert and stressed and very calm, and thereby give our mind a shift also in terms of the kinds of thoughts that we can entertain, the sorts of actions that we can engage in. To make this concrete, if you're very, very stressed, you're very, very upset, two things happen. One, it's very hard to take your focus off whatever it is that's upsetting you. And if you don't know what's upsetting you, you know, pure anxiety, but you don't know why, it's very hard to take your mind off of the feelings of anxiety. In those states of mind, there's another component, which is that for whatever reason, and no one really understands why this is, it feels as if the state that you're in will go on forever. Now, when we're in happy, relaxed states, rarely do we think, gosh, this is going to go on forever. And yet when we are in these unfortunate states of mind, we get the idea somehow, it sort of hijacks our perception of time and we feel like this is never going to stop. If we turn to the body and certain behaviors, let me talk about what those are, we are able to move ourselves along the autonomic continuum and at that point, when we've done that successfully, and it's actually quite straightforward to do, we are able to think about things differently. We start to get a sense that the way we feel might not be the way we're going to feel forever. And it's in those shifts that we start to realize, ah, my mind actually is not my best friend at these extremes, but there's a lot more to it. You're only getting the tip of the iceberg in those states. So that's why I say, if you can't control the mind with the mind, look to the body to control the mind. How would that be adaptive? How would it be adaptive for us to focus all of our attention onto the anxiety? Is that something that you could see a a use for? Absolutely. So uh, let's take stress as an example. And this could be stress, panic, anxiety. You know, each one of those has a definition in medical terms, psychological terms. But to be fair, no one really knows how to draw the line in the brain between fear and stress and anxiety. But we can say with certainty that all of those states involve high levels of alertness, high levels of awareness, sometimes for things in our environment and sometimes just for what's going on internally. When we are stressed, anxious, afraid, waking up in the middle of the night, doesn't matter what triggered it, there are a couple basic things that happen to all of us. First of all, our heart rate quickens. That's kind of an obvious one. Fuel from 
our muscles and our liver is shuttled to particular organs of the body and away from others. In particular, fuel is shuttled towards the big muscles of the body to generate large movements. This is why we quake a bit when we're stressed. The hands will shake. It's preparing us. For, we are prepared for movement. How does that prepare us for movement? Um, the shaking actually is the consequence of trying to not move when we are stressed. Basically, this is why taking a walk or a run, you actually feel like you can kind of dispel the stress. You're not actually dispelling the stress. What's happened is it's like the RP, the RPM are getting cranked up. It's like idling it, right? It's, you know, you could sit there in a parked car and do that, but basically you take the thing out of park and it just wants to go. And so a lot of the times when we're stressed, it's in conditions in which we're trying to remain still public speaking and a tough argument, you know, at the doctor's office about to get an injection, you know, it depends on what stresses people, obviously, but that readiness to, for action is a second component. So heart rate readiness for action by way of shuttling glucose and other fuels to the muscles and then away from the reproductive organs, from digestive organs, et cetera, because that is just not the right time for that. The, another very, very powerful feature of this response is that our, our pupils of our eyes, the dark parts of our eyes, get big. Now, you might think that that expands your visual field, but actually the way the optics of the eye work, that narrows the aperture of your visual field. So when you are stressed, you literally are seeing things through a small aperture, soda straw view of the world, as they say. And under those conditions, you cannot see things in your periphery as well as you could prior to being stressed, but you become exquisitely good at measuring small detail changes in whatever it is that you happen to be looking at. Now there's an internal process too, which is that the aperture on your thinking also becomes very, very narrow. So that if for instance, well, I had this happen the other day, I, I heard something very stressful. I couldn't think about anything else, right? And that might just seem logical. Like, of course you can't think about anything else. It's very stressful. You're concerned about this. But my mind wasn't thinking about this particular incident. It was thinking, if this, then this. Then if that, then that. And that, then that. And so you start, you know, dropping into the future. You start dropping into the past. Like, ah, oh, God, why did we do that? Why, 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 you know, and you start doing all that kind of cycling through things. And of course, there are so many things that can help relax us. Meditation, exercise, a nice healthy meal, social connection. But the kind of fifth column of the stress response is that your aperture of vision, your aperture of thinking gets very narrow, and it becomes harder and harder to do the very things that would keep you out of stress. And so this is kind of the, the double-edged sword that is stress. And so all the more reason why in those moments, if the stress is not desired, because there are moments when stress is desired, you know, you're navigating an emergency, et cetera. But if you don't want to be in that <coughs> narrow aperture of thinking and vision, et cetera, then you need to find some way to bring your level of autonomic arousal, as it's called, down slightly so that you can start thinking about other possibilities. Or, you know, there are instances, I think everyone's been in this kind of situation where the thing that's stressing you out is not going to get resolved today and you need to sleep. And of course, you know you need to sleep and then you can't sleep. And then of course that creates a compounding stress and now you're stressed about not being able to sleep. And then over the course of the next few days, you you know dissolve into a puddle of tears. Um, but fortunately there are ways out of that kind of self-destruction. You've done a lot of work on fear. That was one of the things that you mentioned before. Is there something that everybody is scared of? Because I've heard the story, the wives tale, babies are born with, is it fears of heights and loud noises or something? Is there any truth in that? Or is there something everyone's scared of? There is. I think the one that um, everybody who has a healthy nervous system will react quite robustly to is if you start increasing the amount of carbon dioxide that they're breathing and reduce the amount of oxygen that they're taking in, that's terrifying. Am I you right know, in thinking there's a, a experiment you can do where it's a single breath and that is pretty reliable at bringing on a, an anxiety attack. Yeah, if you have people, please don't do this because you need the right proper medical staff around, but they're, they're great experiments of having people breathe carbon dioxide directly. And it, you, you basically panic. Um, it, it's terrifying. One yeah, breath. one big gulp of, of carbon dioxide will make, make you very afraid. It turns out that there are a little group of neurons, of course, neurons are just nerve cells, that little group of neurons in the brainstem that respond to levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. Turns out the reason we breathe is of course to bring in oxygen and then offload carbon dioxide. But we don't have neurons that stimulate breathing for oxygen. We have neurons that sense when carbon dioxide levels get too high. So if you hold your breath 
eventually carbon dioxide levels go up. And then at the moment that they reach a certain threshold, these neurons fire and trigger the gas reflex. <gasps> so in that moment, you bring in oxygen and then of course you offload some carbon dioxide. That's why it's so important to work on CO2 tolerance, right, for breath work. Yeah, so free divers, uh, a sport I actually don't recommend <laughs> because there's only one way out of that sport, as they say. Um, I have some friends who are free drivers and, and obviously you can do it safely with the right guide and training, et cetera. But it is a very dangerous sport because for most people, when carbon dioxide levels increase in the bloodstream and brain it triggers this gas reflex. What free divers train is carbon dioxide tolerance. So they do that a couple of different ways. And again, please don't do this because you actually, people have died doing this, which, so one way is you can do what's called cyclic hyperventilation, <sighs> right? You do that 25 times or so. And you think, oh, you're bringing a lot of oxygen. You are, but you're also offloading a lot of carbon dioxide, especially if you use forceful exhales. Normally humans breathe through active inhales and passive exhales. You just, they just sort of dump their air passively. But if you do cyclic hyperventilation, you're dumping a lot of carbon dioxide. And then if you were to hold your breath, what you would find is you could hold your breath for a lot longer. Why? Because your carbon dioxide levels are, are reduced, so you don't have the same impulse to breathe. Now on land, that's a more or less safe thing to do, provided that you can get a good gulp of air once the gas reflex hits. If you do that before going underwater, cyclic hyperventilation, they call it air packing, and then you go underwater, you're going to be able to, excuse me, cyclic hyperventilation to air pack and then go underwater, but your carbon dioxide is then lower, you're going to be able to stay under longer. But this is very dangerous because normally when that carbon dioxide threshold hits, you would pop up to the surface, you sort of panic and want to go to the top. Free divers learn to tolerate high levels of carbon dioxide in their bloodstream and stay very, very calm. The way they die is very interesting because it speaks to the physiology. The way they, they die is they'll just be swimming, feeling completely calm because they're very used to, they've trained up the CO2 tolerance, carbon dioxide tolerance. And when they die, they don't suddenly feel like, oh my goodness, I'm running out of air. It's just lights go black. That's it, they're just blackout. And so they're alive and then they're gone. And so this is why they use spotters, they, you know, they have a line, et cetera. Anytime you hear about somebody uh, dying doing free diving, it's rarely because they weren't comfortable at a given depth or because they've it's never not because been to that depth. their gas reflex has kicked in. It's because their gas reflex has been so desensitized that it's after the point at which they die. Precisely. And this, you know, it's sort of like when you hear that um, skilled parachuters die. Why? Well, because they're so comfortable with so many jumps, they actually forget to pull. There's sometimes, there are many instances in which they're, they're uh, videoing the first time jumpers, right? And they're getting the video for them and they themselves forget to pull because they're so comfortable jumping out of planes. And so as people get more and more advanced in something, there's a, there's a new risk that, that surfaces because unless it's very reflexive and they built all, all the protocols in, oftentimes they can overlook the very thing that allowed them to become expert in the first place. Why do my palms get sweaty when I watch videos of people climbing up cranes and stuff like that? You okay. know the ones that I mean? The guy's sure. got a GoPro, there's a dude called James oh, yeah. Kingston from the UK that's a psychopath. He goes up to the highest uh, towers of Dubai uh, illegally in the middle of the night and then I watch it on a screen that's only this big and I yeah. get this visceral response. Yeah, well two things. First of all, I, I can relate. You know, I saw the Free Solo movie with Alex Honnold and you know he lives, and it's still scary to watch, right? You actually know the outcome at the beginning. They sort of make it clear that he manages to do this, and you're, it's still terrifying. And I think it's for the same reason that those YouTube videos are terrifying, which is that we are so visual as animals. We are so visual. I mean, rodents, even a lot of uh, carnivore predators are extremely olfactory, smell-driven. Humans are incredibly visual. I mean, more than 40% of the human brain has something to do with vision, visual navigation, eye movements, um, visual perception, color perception, face perception. We have dedicated areas of the brain that are just for perceiving human faces and the ex micro expressions of human faces. So it's so highly evolved for us. When we see depth of field that's not um, parallel to the ground, it is terrifying with good reason because, you know, what's the universal force that we all experience from the time we're born is gravity. The first thing you learn is that things fall down, not up, 
right? They, you know, it's, it's like the, the fundamental rule that we come into the, the world with. It's like day one, even though the baby is kind of flopping around like a potato but can't even hold its head up, the eyes are off and, you know, the ocular muscles of the eyes are often not very good. So babies, will kind of, their eyes are rolling back in their head. That generally corrects itself over the next few weeks or so. But the feeling of gravity of them, you know, if they feel like they're being dropped even the tiniest bit, right, they will go wide-eyed. So there's a built-in vestibulo-ocular reflex. So when you see depth of field in the direction of the gravitational pull, you actually get a little bit of activity in your cerebellum, which literally means mini brain, a little area of the brain in the back that actually looks like a little mini brain if you were looking at the brain. And that area of the brain is responsible for all the reflexes associated with the falling reflex. It does a lot of other things too. So when you see that depth of field in the direction of gravity, you have a little microactivity in your brain that you might fall. And if you've ever been to a tall bridge or a dam and you go to the edge and you know people love to play with this. There's that also that tower in Toronto they have the big um, Sears Tower. Well, the big no, the big um, the big tower. <laughs> I forget what it is. Maybe it's in Calgary. Goodness, Canadians are going to hate me. Okay, I love Canadians, but for some reason I can't remember this. But they have one of those glass floors there, where you can walk, and it's terrifying. And you know you're not going to fall through it, right? Or they tell you you're not going to fall through it, but it's terrifying because your body and brain are preparing for this immense fall. So when you see this in video, it's the same thing. I always say a picture is worth a thousand words, but a video is worth 10 million pictures. I mean, this is the reason why we're so drawn to things like Instagram scrolling. It's like text, 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 video, you know, or the, the enormous popularity of TikTok, it's video. Now, the enormous popularity of Twitter still escapes me because that's a different, different uh, sort of uh, cultural gravitational pull. But video, and in particular action that gets us in a kind of a primitive mode, that is an extremely alluring visual image. What about emotional fears, like uh, fear of failure or social disapproval or something? Do they work in a, in a similar way, or is there a different part of the brain that's using that? Yeah, great question. So um, a few years ago, a postdoc in my lab, who's now a staff scientist, Melise Yilman, uh, excuse me, Melise, Dr. Melise Yilmaz Balban, she has a long name, um, excellent researcher, uh, studies fear, uh, did a very broad-scale survey of the general public, thousands and thousands of, of entries, um, created this kind of... Uh, cloud of bubbles. The bigger the bubble, the more the, the greater the number of people that had that fear. You saw some we saw some interesting things. So heights certainly, public speaking certainly, doctor's office and syringes certainly. Public speaking fear is very common. Um, social isolation fear is very common, but we also saw some things like dogs. Um, you know, there are a number of people who are afraid of dogs, which is inconceivable to me because I love dogs so exactly much. Exactly the same. Yep, but people you know, people form these associations, whether or not through experience or through indirect experience of observing others. I think public speaking is one of the greatest fear of dying. You know, I, it's funny, I don't, it's not funny, but uh, figure of speech. I never think about dying and being afraid of dying. I think about all the scary things that could happen while I'm living. But there are many people who are just intrinsically afraid of dying. And so that's, that's a big one. Um, for people that uh, don't swim, fear of drowning. For people that swim, less so. Um, for people that have some sort of psychiatric disorder, genuine psychiatric disorder, like obsessive compulsive disorder, which is not just pers obsessive compulsive personality, but obsessive compulsive disorder, fear of, the sh of being discovered and the shame that they have around their obsessions and compulsions. These are, v o true OCD is very common. Do they all uh, live in the same place? All of these different fears that are all existing so, yeah. in the same So I place. was rattling off, and I didn't answer your question um, to the, the more important point, so forgive me. The short answer is they have a final common pathway, which is increased autonomic arousal, and that is funneled through a couple what we call limbic structures, among others. So there's certainly involvement of the, of the now famous amygdala, this, which means almond, is this almond-shaped structure on the two sides of the brain. There's also an area of the brain called the stria terminalis that's also involved in fear. And then the hypothalamus, this small collection of neurons just above the roof of your mouth, which is really, to me, one of the more fascinating areas of the brain, harbors neurons that create a body-wide and brain-wide response to something that the higher order areas of the brain, like the forebrain, see and perceive as dangerous, as threatening. So the short answer is yes, it all funnels through hypothalamus, amygdala, stria terminalis, and autonomic nervous system. That's the final common pathway. But 
in terms of the variety of different things that can stimulate fear and the ways that they can do that, that is highly contextual. So the forebrain, this real estate in the brain right behind, behind the forehead, is incredible because it's sort of free real estate for you to customize for your life according to what happens to you early on. So for instance, you might not be at all afraid of heights and you say, well, why is that so? Well, maybe when you were a kid, you were one of those maniacs that like, you know, doing in the States, we call them cherry drops, the kids that could you know, swing on their feet and then jump off the, the bar. And, and then other kids are timidly crawling to the top of the thing, don't even want to go up the ladder to the slide. There's a ton of variation. And that variation does not exist in the kind of deeper circuitry, the final common path circuitry. It exists in the learning that we experienced early in life. One bad fall, can do it. I mean, I was bitten very badly by a German shepherd when I was a kid. Head eye, almost got my eye, but you know, for whatever reason, I've always liked dogs anyway. But there are other things that I've experienced that have left long-term negative imprints. So I, it's highly contextual. And a lot of it has to do with what happens immediately after the bad experience. This is why nowadays there's a, a lot of legal use of the drug ketamine after traumas, you know, this is all very dark stuff, unfortunately, but if you, you know, you just imagine the family member that was just in a car crash and saw their, the driver, their loved one impaled onto the steering column. I mean, what could be more horrible than that? Nowadays, if they come into the emergency room, they will often give them an injection of ketamine, which is a dissociative anesthetic to get them to dissociate from this extreme emotional state. So there are ways now to treat this. Um, and ketamine is used uh, clinically at later periods too. Didn't you, you, you did a, an experiment where you went uh, diving with sharks and I think that there was a complication and you went back the next day to redo it. I'm going to guess that this is for the exact same reason to sort of conquer and um, integrate the experience. Yeah, uh, to make a long story short, we were, went two years in a row out to Guadalupe Island where there are a lot of great white sharks. Some of the more expert shark divers were cage exiting. They were leaving the cage. The first year I did not. The second year... I decided I would, but the day before I did, I went down into the cage, just get comfortable again down there, and I had an air failure, and the safety tanks were out also, and obviously I experienced extreme carbon dioxide uh, overload and panic. I, I didn't full-blown panic. I kept enough awareness that I was able to, obviously I'm here. Um, I survived doing a share air protocol, et cetera, but it was a very bad situation. I don't like to say I nearly died because that's actually sort of letting the bug in my brain. I like to joke that the Reaper came in and, um, you know, and offered me a fist bump and I offered him a different gesture instead. So I survived, but the next day I woke up very, very distraught because I had this bug in this loop in my brain. I, you know, this notion that I came so close to, to the end. And so I did go back down and I did cage exit. And I don't say that to, um, suggest that it was the smartest decision. Uh, um, obviously you're safer on the boat or on land. I don't say it to sound, you know, again, tough or anything. I did it deliberately because I did not want to return to home with this loop of fear. And so I went back into the traumatic circumstance and obviously made it out. And if you look at all the successful treatments for trauma, they all involve getting close to the trauma-inducing mindset, exposure therapy, gradual and assisted by a clinician, but rarely, if ever, are people with serious trauma encouraged to get as far away from the feeling of, at least not in the clinical setting. This has a lot of implications for things like trigger warnings. Uh, colleagues of mine in psychiatry, I've asked them directly, what do you think of trigger warnings? And they said, you know, it, I mean, there's some logic to it on the, on the surface, but if you really think about true trauma, and we can define trauma, Dr. Paul Conti was on my podcast, his amazing trauma psychiatrist. He said, trauma is an experience, is not just a bad experience. Trauma is an experience that changes your nervous system such that it behaves differently in the future, that in a way that's maladaptive for you. So if you look at all the trauma treatments, they're all about learning to talk about the trauma, even experiencing some of the same feelings. So things like trigger warnings and all these things that buffer us against feeling our true feelings do nothing but prolong the trauma and prolong and exacerbate fear. You had David Goggins in the lab to study him for fear. What did you learn from looking at that guy? Yeah, David's, David's great. I always chuckle with David because, you know, the one thing about David is what you see on social media is actually 
what you get when you interact with David. We worked long hours one day and I was, everyone was ready to tap out. This was a bunch of people in uh, Silicon Valley for a day, you know, doing some workshop type thing. And he just, he was changing into his running shorts midway. He was going to run to the airport and he ran to the airport as far as I know. To I, get his flight. I believe so, you know. <laughs> um, but there was this moment of, should we continue? Should we take a break? And he was like, no, let's keep going, keep going. Um, everything you see and read and hear about David is exactly how he shows up. It's really wonderful. Um, he came to the lab and he did, you know, we have a virtual version of the shark thing, um, which of course is not the same as the real experience. But for people who are afraid of sharks, it's quite scary for them and allows us to study fear. David was, he's very afraid of sharks, which was sort of uh, amusing to me, given that as a seal, he had to spend a lot of time in water. But uh, he was first one in, wanted to do the VR, talked about how he didn't like it, but um, but that's why he did it. You know, constant uh, testing himself. In fact, I think even though David's quite successful, I think, and has many, many options of how to spend his time. I believe this is correct. I think right now he's doing fire jumping. He's, um, fighting fires in the wilderness by zip lining in or fast lining in or jumping out of planes. So he's constantly pushing that, uh, that friction lever to create, uh, or build or further build this thing about leaning into friction. And this is a term that isn't really scientific, but that I decided to coin because this idea of limbic friction, that when we're very tired and we need to be in action, or when we're very stressed and we need to perform in a more calm and controlled way, there's friction on both sides. Getting out of bed when we're exhausted, hard, very hard often. Leaning into action in a calm and deliberate way when we're freaking out, like going to give a public lecture if one has fear of public speaking, also hard. So this limbic friction, and David just seems to seek what I call limbic friction in every domain of life. Is that like exposure therapy for limbic friction then? Essentially, yeah. I mean, what you're training and improving when you're getting better at dealing with stress is this ability to tolerate high amounts of adrenaline in your body and to think clearly and function well. I mean, adrenaline is epinephrine and just a little bit of physiology. It's released from the adrenals, obviously, above the kidneys. That gets your body organs amped up and energized. It can't cross the so-called blood-brain barrier. You have a high-restriction fence that we call the blood-brain barrier around the brain. Keep bad molecules out. Adrenaline, therefore, is released also within the brain from a little cluster of neurons called locus ceruleus. The name doesn't matter. So when you are stressed, your brain and your body both wake up. And that adrenaline hijacks certain systems, narrows your visual focus, et cetera, et cetera. If you look at almost all stress inoculation protocols, cold water, ice bath, cold shower, cyclic hyperventilation. <sighs> Those all do the same thing. They generate a lot of adrenaline release in the brain and a lot of adrenaline release in the body. But it's different if, those, if the adrenaline in the brain and body is evoked by you, that you did it. Because under conditions under which you did the ice bath deliberately and now you're wide awake and really, really alert, there's this feeling that you have options. It wasn't done to you, but you can train up an ability to, for instance, think c clearly and calmly, um, maybe even do some simple math problems in your head, or maybe try and relax while there's all this adrenaline in your system. And that carries over so that when you, you know, we've all done it, you're driving along, the person in front of you stops short, and you're almost in the accident, right? There's that moment where you could panic or that moment where you could you know, road rage or that moment where you could freak out. But if you are familiar with the feeling of adrenaline in your brain and body, you navigate that in a, in a calmer way. How? Well, because adrenaline is generic. There's no adrenaline for the car crash, adrenaline for the heights, adrenaline for the, the, uh, the relationship situation. It's all the same. So we can get better. We can raise our stress threshold, as I like to refer to it. And that can be done through cold water or cyclic hyperventilation ideally not at the same time, but cold water, you know, is a universal stimulus for creating adrenaline release. And there's a big range of cold, not infinite, but a big range of cold in which you can generate adrenaline without harming your tissue. Whereas with heat, you get into a very hot environment or very low oxygen environment. You'll also get a lot of adrenaline, but you can also suffocate and burn yourself. So this is why cold is used in Navy SEAL screening and training. And this is why I think so many people really like the ice bath and cold showers. It has a bunch of other positive effects, but it is a great trigger for adrenaline. Speaking about relationships, one of the most uh, common traumas probably 
that people are going to go through is heartbreak, right? You're going to be in a relationship that you imagine is going to continue forever, maybe when you're 18 or sometimes when you're 48, and then it's going to stop. Have you thought about the neuroscience of what's happening during heartbreak? You know, we did. So I've done episodes of our podcast on uh, love attachment and relationships, uh, which is a fascinating literature, mostly from psychology, but also bio- biological literature. Um, and that's mostly about people's orientation toward attachment. So they're just very quickly. There's the so-called secure attached style. This typically emerges in childhood when there's a very predictable care, um, caregiver, carey uh, relationship between child and most often mother, but it can be father too or other caregiver. Just so happens that the classic experiments were done on mothers because this was in the 1970s and there weren't as many reverse role, you know, homes, et cetera. There were some, but not as many as there are now. So that's one style of attachment. The parent leaves, the child gets a little distraught, but then can distract itself doing other things or just simply do other things because they have a high degree of intrinsic knowledge, not the thought, but intrinsic calm. The autonomic nervous system doesn't feel any need to ramp up because the mom returns. Then there's the so-called insecure attachment styles, and there are a bunch of different ones, but those are the ones where it's really stressful when the parent leaves. It's not clear they're going to come back, and when they come back, it's not clear that there's, they're going to reestablish the bond, the child will feel uh, supported, etc. Here's what's fascinating. Those same neural circuits are repurposed for romantic attachment in adult life. The same circuits, which shouldn't surprise us. I mean, why would the brain throw away valuable circuitry? But this whole Freudian notion that, you know, childhood attachment styles map onto adult attachment styles, that's real. That's physiological. Now, one important point, it's not one for one in the sense that, let's say you had a secure attachment to your father. Let's say it's a young, a young girl, and as a baby and a young child, she had a secure attachment to her father and an insecure attachment to her mother. In adulthood, and let's say she's heterosexual, so in adulthood, she prefers men as romantic partners. This girl grows up, and you might say, well, she had a good relationship to her dad, so she's going to have a good secure attachment style in her adult heterosexual relationships. Ah, often it's not the case. They will transplant or superimpose the insecure attachment style to the, to the mother onto male relationships, but have great relationships to female friends, for instance. So we have to be a little careful to not map one for one. That's important. So all of that is in us. And then you were talking about breakups, and we did an episode on grief. And the way that grief works in the brain and nervous system is that there are three sort of factors that are mapped in our consciousness and our subconscious. And these are space, time and this notion of closeness, which is attachment. Space and time is very simple. It's where is the person that I love and when will I see them next, right? I mean, if you have a relative that lives overseas and you know they're alive, you're not going to grieve them. You might really miss them, but you're not going to grieve them the same way you would if suddenly you get the note, unfortunately, that they passed away. And then attachment is how close you are to them, like how critically you rely on them for internal control and support. And that doesn't mean they have to be an immediate caregiver. It could just be like a really good friend. You call them mates over in the UK, right? Like a really good friend that just your knowledge of him just makes you feel good. You feel better in the world. You know, as a guy who mostly grew up with kind of a big pack of male friends, I mean, I feel strongest and happiest and most secure in life when I see something about one of my friends doing well in life. It just makes me feel good. If one of them dies, and unfortunately, I'm getting to the age where a number of them have died, then you feel like all of a sudden, like, goodness, like there's a loss internally, right? Okay, that's all sort of obvious. But what's interesting is that the grief process itself is about restructuring this map, this map, think of it like a tripod. It's got three pieces, space, time, and closeness. When someone dies, it's very confusing for the brain because where are they in space? Well, the body is put someplace. Maybe it's cremated, maybe it's not. We have notions of a spirit, and that depends on one's orientation, a soul or a spirit, okay? Or if you don't, then you don't, then then where do they go, right? And then time, when will you see them again? there's the never. You'll never see them again. And the closeness component remains. And so there's an untethering of this map. And so there's been brain imaging studies, um, beautiful work by uh, Mary Frances O'Connor at University of Arizona, showing that if you look in the brain and people that are in grief from loss of a really strong attachment, the state of brain and body that gets flipped on is a motivational state. It's 
exactly the same circuitry in the brain that one sees active if someone very hungry is put just outside the wall of some delicious food or if an animal that really wants to mate I guess mate with animals you call it copulate they really want to copulate with another animal is put just beyond the wall of that animal but they can smell them I mean these are highly motivated desiring states so grief is a motivated state to to bridge the distance in time and space and yet it's impossible and so the process of grief is a gradual waning of that motivation and a gradual shift of the memory of the person into some concept whether or not it's a soul whether or not it's just the past whether or not it's their energy you know again it depends on what the forebrain of that particular person believes shifts that concept of that person into a place where the brain is comfortable there's no more autonomic arousal there's no motivation and we've all experienced this if you've had a loss and i've i've had a loss for instance where my graduate advisor died and i adored her and every once in a while her daughter will call me from her cell phone and she kept the same number on that ph phone and the name and everything so every once in a while it'll ring Barbara Chapman, and I'll reach for the phone, and then there's this moment where I'm like, oh, goodness. So anyway, I'm going on and on just to color this with example, but when there's a breakup, it's exceedingly hard, especially if the person is young. You know, if you look at suicides after breakups, those are far more common in younger people than they are in older people. Why? Because the relationship represents the whole future. They have no concept that they're, they know there are other people, but it sort of feels like the whole world is, is shutting down. So in breakups what's happened is the person is no longer available in time and space this is why when someone breaks up you literally have to let them go right you know con constant pursuing of them is out of context is not healthy they have a name for that it's called a stalker don't do it um but it's almost as if you have to the brain has to think that the person is gone in time and space and this has become much harder with social media right because people can check up on people they can hear from people in the old days like when i was growing up you just like took the phone off the hook or you you diverted your attention now we are constantly renewing that the person is still there and so love and the loss of love and the death grief are virtually identical it's that motivational state and this is why it's so hard to not reach out to somebody that you really miss and want back i saw a study last week that had researchers asking participants to rate emotional and physical pain of a breakup they found that women tend to be more negatively affected by breakups, reporting high levels of both physical and emotional pain. But while breakups hit women the hardest, they tended to recover more fully. Men, on the other hand, rarely fully recovered. I thought that was very interesting. I wasn't too sure what that meant. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, it also rings true with my, my experience and my observations. It, I, I think, I mean, this could relate to a number of things. And here I'm painting with a broad brush, right? But, um, you know, how comfortable one is feeling their feelings is male or female is going to strongly dictate how quickly one moves through grief. This is the same thing as trauma. The more willing someone is to feel the full depth and intensity of the feelings that they associate with that trauma, the more quickly they're going to move through the trauma. Uh, again, I'm lifting from Paul Conti's words, so these aren't mine, but you know, people use a number of strategies. They use distraction. They use states like uh, they sublimate to things like anger um, and avoidance of various kinds in order to not feel the traumatic feelings or not feel the breakup. People will, you know, uh, try and self-soothe with alcohol or try and self-soothe with multiple new partners or whatever it happens to be. It doesn't work. It just extends it because this map of space, time, and closeness needs to be fractured. And the only way to do that is for the brain to have to confront the reality, which is that whether by death or by, by breakup, they are no longer available. It's like the food on the other side of that wall is gone. It's just not there anymore. Uh, or that the food that was accessible, now there's a wall in between and you will not get through it. And you know, you can see this actually in animal studies that are kind of hard, they're actually very hard to watch. You'll see the animal perseverate, literally damage its own body trying to get through a barrier to something it's highly motivated to see. People do that post breakup. They usually do that by talking to everybody about the breakup, um, which is its own form of perseverating on the motivation. What did I do? What did I do wrong? This and that. And some of that analysis is healthy. Some of it's not. Now, why would one group be more, uh, let's just say, effective at dealing with breakups? It's probably the ability to really feel the full intensity of how sad it is and be able to confront that. And here, I'm, you know, I'm a male. I've only ever lived in a male body. So all I can tell you is that I think from a very early age, um, there's a, an ability that at least 
I, I'm sure it transcends to women too, um, or extends to women too, but learning to pack down feelings, right? And so when are we really talking about when we're talking about pack down feelings? I'm not a psychologist, but what we learn is top down control, forebrain to autonomic control. It's the same thing like, I don't want to jump off the high dive or I don't want to do this public speaking, but I'm going to, I'm going to kind of like, I'm just going to force myself. I'm going to David Goggins it, right? Grief is, a, is an autonomic state. Uh, we say it has valence, it has negative valence, but it's high levels of autonomic arousal with a negative connotation because you can be high levels of autonomic arousal with happiness, right? You can be very alert and aroused and happy, very alert and aroused and sad. It's very alert and aroused and sad, and yet we learn how to tamp that down. What is tamping down? It's reducing our heart rate. It's going to work each day, being a functional human being. You know, there's a lot of that rather than allowing ourselves to, you know, sob uncontrollably into a pillow. Um, some people are better at this. I mean, the late Steve Jobs was a big proponent of scream therapies. He used to go up into the hills behind Stanford. He actually owns some, still owns some property back there. He was really into, you know, catharsis, cathartic release of internal state that he felt would allow him to like return as a happier, nicer person. He was also kind of well-known for screaming at people in the office. So he obviously had a lot pent up inside. Um, so I think the better that we can lean into the emotional states that we fear the most, but in a controlled way where we're not harming ourselves or other people, the better. The more that we try and avoid that and we try and sublimate or just, you know, and I've done this, so I'm speaking from experience, you know, I would use the anger or the sadness from an experience to just work 10, 10 times longer, 10 times harder to just get that much more focus. You're taking that autonomic arousal, that narrow aperture and that energy, and you're putting it onto something that moves your life forward. So in some cases that's good because you still need to function. And it give, but it can give you the, here I'll just say, it, it gave me the illusion that I was working through something because you get all the accoutrements and rewards of hard work. But what you don't do is remap that space-time closeness map. And then you find, I guarantee, you find yourself five or 10 years later wondering why you're so exhausted or why certain things in life aren't going well. And it's because when they say you haven't dealt with the loss, you never actually allowed yourself to feel the feelings. But once you do, it's like a valve, it releases. You hear musicians say that the most recent album was shit because I didn't have any heartbreak to work right. through. Right. And it is strange how people, it's a difficult thing to pass because a little bit of it is kind of like alchemy, right? A little bit of it is kind of like turning something that's terrible into something that's useful and beautiful. It's fuel. But you're right. It, it is a, it's a, a hiding away from what it is that you actually need to do, from the work that you need to do. And in a world which is a meritocracy where people want success and status and accolade and fame, and you go, well, enemies and revenge and bitterness, resentment, pretty good motivators. Maybe yeah. I could use some of that. Yeah. Maybe I should go out of my way to try and put myself into positions where this motivates me. And working out where that falls on the ledger is, is a difficult one. It is. And I think uh, it depends on life stage and it depends on how one is going to work it out. I mean, the, the narrative around the shark dive, I mean, even as I say it now, several, that was 2017 was the second dive. When I think about all that, I think like, that was crazy. I was out there studying fear and I almost was the professor who died studying fear. It would have been a terrible <laughs> end to the story. Um, what was I doing? Don't do this. Don't do this. But, you know, there are times in our life where we feel compelled to take on certain challenges for whatever reason. I, there's a phrase that doesn't exist in the scientific literature, but it captures two um, components of physiology that are absolutely factual. Earlier, we talked about limbic friction. Um, as it relates to creative process and sublimation of anger and sadness and creating things from bad events, books, music, etc., um, the, th the words that come to mind are li limbic resonance. The human beings resonate with these extreme states. You know, there aren't many great albums written about a good day walking on a Sunday in the park. Like, it's kind of boring. I mean, there's the, the beautiful painting Sunday in the Park with George, but and I'll be honest, it's beautiful, but it's also kind of boring. You can look at the details of it for a while. People like intensity. The scream is, that, you know, people can look at that for a long time and it speaks to the psychosis of the artist, et cetera. You know, people don't generally bond through passive, relaxed states unless they've also been through a lot together, right? I mean, you even think about uh, the, we could talk about this separately if you want, but 
all of us are here because of the autonomic seesawing that is the reproductive act. It goes from highly aroused. Is that how you refer to it in your lab? Yeah, you know, scientists. Autonomic have, seesawing. It is. It's very interesting that the arousal process is one of increase in autonomic arousal in order to get true arousal, but then not so much that it inhibits arousal, then mating behavior, and then the, the orgasm response in males and females is highly what we call sympathetic, not emotionally, it can be, I suppose, emotionally sympathetic, but from a pure physiology standpoint, it's a activation, hyperactivation of the stress system, even though it has positive valence. And then there's a very quick rebound to the so-called parasympathetic arm of the autonomic nervous system, this deep relaxation, which, we don't really know why I wasn't consulted at the design phase, but we think that that post-coital bliss and, is, and the kind of relaxing, the desire to not run around a bunch more for most people, was to exchange odorant molecules to increase pair bonding. And even if people aren't trying to pair bond, because people don't always just mate to reproduce, but that uh, some of the molecules that are released in each of the two individuals, oxytocin being the main one, give people a sense of kind of postcoital bliss and and it's a very calm one that creates opportunity for bonding and discussion that is all like pillow talk there are other forms of pillow talk too post nut clarity andrew <laughs> but for women it might be something different right of course a different different name i only speak in the language of physiology but for both men and women this happens it creates this little orb of closeness that is both physiological and but neurochemical too so what we can say for sure is that whether or not it was in vivo or in a dish, we are all here because two parents, right? A male and a female, unless you're a condor where two females can produce a baby, this has now been shown, right? But as far as we know, where a male and a female reproduce because they each went through this arc of arousal, not too high, arousal, extreme stress, relaxation. That happened separately or together because in vitro it could be, uh, fertilization could be separate. So the test of whether or not we get to reproduce is actually the ability to, to assuming that people are doing this uh, together and not through uh, in vitro fertilization, is a test of whether or not people can coordinate their autonomic nervous systems. Now there are ways around that and to override it, but by and large, that's the way humans evolved and the way all other animals evolved. Now limbic Resonance is a good way, I think, to describe that process, but that carries over to other things too. An album about an extreme loss, a song or a poem about extreme loss, brings the reader, the listener, into a limbic state that's very similar or approximates what the creator experienced, right? The person who created that art or that poetry. And in the same way, if something is about a lot of anger, you know, if you like loud, fast music or something like that, it's an extreme state. It has a gravitational pull to it. There's, again, I'm using this language, limbic resonance. Rarely, if ever, do human beings bond through nothing. They bond through shared experience. And you think of what makes people feel close? Well, there are a couple things. And this has everything to do with time perception. Typically, when there's a high degree of limbic resonance, it means that the molecule dopamine was increased substantially over baseline at some point. Dopamine is almost always discussed in terms of pleasure, but it's the molecule of motivation, drive, and to some extent reward. It tends to narrow our visual focus. And believe it or not, dopamine is the molecule from which adrenaline is manufactured. Biochemically, you get adrenaline from dopamine. So these two act as close cousins to put us into these states of motivation and have energy to pursue things. When dopamine is very present in our system, or if you're in the company of someone else and there's a lot of dopamine, two things happen. First of all, you're very motivated, narrowing a focus, that's one. The other is that the way that you perceive time is quite a bit different. For instance, if you ever had an amazingly exciting day, just tons of things, maybe you meet someone new, you're having the best time, I mean, just think falling in love and the, the most incredible date that you can imagine how it begins and how it ends, it just feels incredible. It all feels like it went by very, very fast. And yet when you look back on that day, it seems like so much happened. Now think about an opposite situation. You go to the doctor's office and you're sitting in the doctor's lobby and you're waiting and you're waiting and there's no phone reception so you can't scroll Instagram. You're waiting and you're waiting. It's incredibly boring. It's a very low dopamine state. It feels like it goes on forever. And yet when you look back, nothing really happened. So dopamine changes our perception of time. And in terms of developing human bonds, this has been well established that if two people, for instance, go three different places in a given day, 
they tend to feel like they know each other far better than if they stayed in one place, even for a longer period of time. Did you know that pickup artists were weaponizing this about 15 years ago? Oh, no, it doesn't surprise me, but I'm, I'm sorry to hear it. It was <laughs> common held wisdom in the pickup artist community that you were supposed to have a three location date to manipulate precisely this, to make the girl feel like you had progressed further down the maturation process of, of spending time together. Surely there have to be female pickup artists too. Uh, yeah, although I feel like their job's probably easier. I can't comment. <laughs> I, I don't know. Back, I've, I've to, never been one. Going back to dopamine, how just how triggering are our phones when it comes to dopamine? Okay, great question. Uh, we often hear that you know, the social media getting dopamine hit after dopamine hit. When we first get on social media after a long, for the first time or after a long period of time, the amount of dopamine that's released we think is quite substantial. It's novel. Remember, dopamine is about novelty, surprise, and the sense that we are on some exciting track. That's what dopamine is really about. It puts us into states of readiness, anticipation, looking, seeking, etc. almost always for things outside the confines of our skin. Uh, just to contrast it maybe for a bit f more of a future discussion, serotonin does the opposite. When there's a lot of serotonin in our brain and body, typically it makes us feel satisfied, sated, and more quiescent, comfortable with what we have in our own immediate sphere and within us, right? The comfort of a good meal, the food you have, dopamine is about go, go, go. If you look at somebody who's high on cocaine or methamphetamine, it's all about pursuit because that's a very dopaminergic drug. You look at somebody who's taken a drug and I'm not suggesting people do this, but it really ramps up serotonin. Let's say a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, Prozac, Zoloft, et cetera. The side effects of those drugs, if the dosages are too high, lack of appetite, lack of libido, kind of meh about life, you know, then so they'll adjust the dose down. That's because those are serotonergic drugs. So in, in general, when we are in pursuit of things, dopamine is, is quite high. So now you have to remind me your question because I've set up the dopamine serotonin uh, parallel. Cell phones. Ah, cell phones, yes. Um, forgive me. So the thing about cell phones is when you first get on there and you have, let's say, you're, it, no Wi-Fi on the flight or something and you land, it can actually be quite stimulating. You get a lot of dopamine. Oh, there's this. Oh, there's that. But very quickly when you're scrolling on social media, you're no longer getting the novelty, but you're continuing to do it and you almost don't know why you're doing it. At that point, it shifts over to something that's a bit more like an obsessive compulsive behavior where the, we can define an obsessive compulsive behavior where the obsession leads to a compulsion. So the obsession is a thought, the compulsion is a behavior, but the acting out of the compulsion merely serves to increase the obsession. Right? This is very different than being obsessed with food or obsessed with cleanliness. There's no payoff. Right, exactly. There's no anxiety relief by carrying out the compulsion. With OCD behaviors, like scrolling social media, the dopamine quickly wanes, and then you find that you're just sort of, and we've all been there, you're scrolling, you're like, why am I doing this? This isn't that interesting. That is, this isn't that interesting. Now, the algorithms for social media are very clever, and I don't want to demonize it. I, you know, provide a lot of, a lot of my life is spent on, you know, on social media now, but in the algorithms that they've incorporated function on the, the most powerful way to keep people doing a behavior or an animal for that matter is intermittent random reward a random intermittent reward that you don't know when you're going to hit the jackpot. So you're scrolling, you're scrolling, and then you see something. Typically it's very high what, you know, in nerd speak, we'd say signal to noise. So if you're reading some interesting things, this came out in the news, this came out, and then it's all of a sudden a riot or a person that is jump, is base jumping off a building or, um, you know, for people that are, are scrolling, looking at bodies or something like that, uh, live bodies. So hopefully people aren't looking at dead bodies, but look, if something's very tragic, then that has this gravitational pull. And then you, what happens is you start getting the system working for that next dopamine hit that you don't know when it's going to come. It's just like gambling. So I look at social media as initially being very dopaminergic, driving reward, surprise, and excitement, but very quickly transitioning to something more like OCD and the kinds of behaviors where it looks, if, you, if we were to look at ourselves through the lens of an experiment like we would an animal experiment, we think that animal is sick. If you saw an animal digging in the corner, looking, 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 looking for a bone, the dog is looking, 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 you'd think that's really sad. That's us, right? That's us. I'm pointing at myself intentionally. That's us. So we have to learn to self-regulate the amount of time, but that doesn't have to be a process of 
you know, scruffing ourselves and saying, don't do it, don't do it. Think about it in terms of the positive. The more time away from something, the more positively reinforcing it will be when you return. And that just to sort of superimpose this onto the relationship conversation, you know, many of us are fortunate to have partners that we love spending a lot of time with. It's also good to miss that person every once in a while. Now that might be an hour for some people apart of no communication. It might be a week. Everyone varies on this, on the spectrum. But the idea of missing someone is that positive anticipation, that kind of pain, right? It's a motivational state. And then when you see them, it's all the richer. So you can imagine that the dopamine circuits can be used to more successfully navigate a number of different things. And, you know, a lot of couples completely quash the excitement and the pleasure of being together, not just physical pleasure, but just pleasure of being together because they just spend too much damn time too much together. Familiarity. Or they're texting all the time, right? Or, you know, and, and this whole thing around texting has become a really interesting test of dopamine expectation. There's a thing called dopamine reward prediction error. If you think the reward is coming, and it doesn't, you drop below baseline levels of dopamine. That's why you should never tell someone that this restaurant's going to be the best restaurant you've ever been to in your life. Exactly. I made the mistake of telling my girlfriend on the way here, I want her to read this book. I'm like, this is an amazing book. You should read it. And I caught myself and I thought, damn it, I'm actually detracting from how good she's going to experience the book. As. Tell her it was terrible. Oh yeah. It's, it's really good though. This is the problem. It's, <laughs> it's hard to do. So, um, I think the key is to, uh, to leverage dopamine reward prediction error in the best way, it's the surprise that, you know, if you take kids you're driving home from school and suddenly you pull into the ice cream shop, they're going to be so ecstatic. But if you tell them you're going to go to the ice cream shop and it's closed, huge drop below baseline. Does that mean if you tell them that you're going to the ice cream shop and it's open, that's less than not telling them that you're going to the ice cream shop and it's surprised? Correct. It's, it's, it, they literally tear out into maximum surprise is the maximum dopamine release. Then successful completion of the mission, so, <laughs> as it were, is the next and then unsuccessful. Is there not an the argument to be made that you would be able to uh, drag out the amount of time that dopamine is released for because of the anticipation? Yeah. So, well, and people do this in relationship quite a lot, right? Anticipation is the kind of ultimate fuel of the courting dance, right? I mean, this is also, but one has to be very careful because whether or not it's from the male side or the female side or whatever variation thereof, <laughs> there's a, you only get so many reward prediction errors before people start to predict or associate low dopamine with somebody or some experience. In other words, if you, you know, uh, I'll use an example, uh, not from my own life, but if you say, you know, we're going to Costa Rica on vacation and then you say, listen, I, I have to work. They might understand, but that's a letdown. It's a dopamine reward prediction error in the direction of lower dopamine. They might recover from it. They might not, but most people recover from it. If you do that two or three times, what ends up happening, you can model this beautifully, and they've seen this experimentally in animals and humans. Then you say, okay, we're really going to Costa Rica this time. And you think, well, the surprise is going to be that you actually go. The amount of dopamine that's released for positive, for a successful completion of the initial goal is far lower than it ever would have been. So you can only cry wolf. So, yeah, I, I suppose that's not the right way to put it. You can only... Um, create positive anticipation so many times and then create a letdown before completion, the, the pro delivery of the promise has very little impact. And so you have to be very careful with one's words. Better to say nothing than to let somebody down uh, for sure in the context of human relationship. And, you know, this plays out in some um, less perhaps uh, amusing ways where, you know, you look at people who are successful in life and you always hear success builds success. And it's absolutely true. Like when students come to my lab and they do a PhD thesis, it's very important for me to get them onto a research track quickly that they're going to experience some success. Because if they spend four years and then it fails, that's devastating. And then they have to start over again. Same thing with kids. I mean, getting some success early on, even if it's low bar success, really does build up one's positive anticipation uh, and ability to perform well in the future because dopamine gives energy. Remember, it's the precursor to adrenaline and the sense that the world is predictable. Now, this can go a wrong way too. And I see this a lot with the idea that everyone gets a blue ribbon. This is terrible too, because if everyone is rewarded, every child is rewarded regardless of how well they performed, if they're all rewarded to the same level, you actually flatten the dopamine curve. And so in that sense, yes, everyone might feel, you know, celebrated, but you actually are lowering motivation for 
the given activity. Uh, this has a whole landscape of, of research uh, in back of it related to intrinsic versus extrinsic reward. The strongest motivation is always going to be intrinsic motivation. If you reward kids or adults for something too many times, even if they like that activity, the, the propensity to do that activity will be reduced. But if you reward without effort or without success, that is devastating for a nervous system. In fact, I've gone on record and I'll say it again and again and again, which is that dopamine that arrives without prior effort destroys people. This is, this is drugs. This is, uh, you know, this is things like uh, cocaine and amphetamine. It's high levels of dopamine with no effort. Okay. They had to buy it. They had to find it. They did whatever it, but that's no, there's no physical effort or mental effort involved in getting the dopamine peak. This is why hard work followed by reward. Great. Working hard on a relationship and then it gets better. Or there's a breakthrough or whatever it is that is powerfully positive. Dopamine that just arrives because you say, oh, you're here, so you get reward, terrible. And this is why rewarding every little positive thing that a child does with, you know, their favorite thing eventually diminishes the value of that thing and diminishes their ability to get motivated on their own. It's a very, very powerful system. One has to be very, very careful how one leverages it. What are your thoughts on dopamine detoxing? Is that legit? Does it work? Well, up until about six months ago, I would have said no. Um, but my colleague, Anna Lemke. She's been book. on the show. Yeah, oh, she's great. F- fantastic. Um, I have such admiration and respect. She's for great. Her. Yeah. Yeah. I, just a brief anecdote. I was, I direct a neuroanatomy course for the medical students at Stanford. I should have known who Anna was. And then one day she came in to give a lecture on dopamine and addiction. And my first thought was, oh my goodness, you know, I have to get her on the podcast and have to, get, I want her talking to the world because it's such powerful knowledge. So if people haven't heard that episode already, go listen to Chris talking to Dr. Anna Lemke. I'm going to listen to it. I've listened to all her podcasts that I was aware of. But again, we were talking about it's hard, sometimes hard to find podcasts. So I'm going to listen to that. Um, cannot listen to her enough times. You know, the, the dopamine, you asked earlier about the arc of dopamine and how long it lasts. The, the, one of the t- key takeaways from that book, uh, Dopamine Nation, that I've incorporated in my own life is that there are certain activities like cold water that create long lasting arcs of dopamine. Those can be very useful for putting us into long lasting motivational states. So, um, these are not big peaks and troughs. These are the pain of the cold water followed by this long, long arc of dopamine. Wonderful. It's a, kind of an antidepressant positive motivator, natural stimulus. I always say, if you don't have access to an ice bath, Cold showers, yes, will work. If you have a shower that doesn't get cold enough, keep in mind that the original studies showing this dopamine increase had people get into 60 degree water, which is not that cold, 60 degree Fahrenheit, for 45 minutes to an hour. So your water bill might go up, but you could just draw a kind of cool bath and get in that up to the neck. So, because I realize there are sometimes some cost barriers to people. They, not everyone has an ice bath. Dopamine detoxing. Yeah. So dopamine detoxing is something that apparently today my uh, short-term working memory is off. I, I swear I well, can't. Well, you have a mate. Get that in you. I can't think of any. I, I'm caffeinated. I can't think of any um, uh, pharmacologic reason for it, but uh, no excuses. Um, so dopamine detox, I would have thought, was not something real. Um, it seemed kind of silly to me, actually. Um, and I'll tell you why it seems silly and why it still seems silly, but why it may have some utility. But then Anna... Dr. Anna Lemke told me that it actually can be quite useful to take some time and space away from social media, certainly from any addictive drugs, that's the treatment for addiction, and restore those dopamine levels to baseline. Now, the way that dopamine detoxing was initially described in the Bay Area, where it seemed to be a lot of tech types were talking about it, was in terms of, I heard something like, oh, people aren't even looking at other people's faces. You know, they're really kind of living this like monkish lifestyle, like no food of, that they really enjoy, no anything. That to me seems kind of crazy and kind of extreme. I mean, I can understand not ingesting a lot of highly palatable foods, you know, eating some blander foods. I can understand not, um, certainly not doing any prescription drugs or taking some time off from caffeine. Caffeine increases dopamine receptors, which makes the the dopamine that's available more powerful at evoking the dopamine response. I can understand avoiding certain substances and behaviors, but the idea that you weren't going to look people in the eye because there's going to be too much dopamine. I mean, I guess it depends on who you're looking in the eye and how much their look positively arouses you. But the fact of the matter is that that's not, that's not a very rational way to think about dopamine detox, but staying out of, you know, high intensity, um, highly rewarding activities, 
I think could be useful in terms of reestablishing that dopamine balance. And everything we know from Anna's work is that dopamine, you know, if you drive those dopaminergic states too long, addictive drugs, et cetera, people can do this with sex, food, drugs, gambling, social media, all sorts of things, um, pornography, you know, what ends up happening is the amount of dopamine that's released over time goes down and down and down and down and pretty much is traversing into the territory of pain. And then people, again, are back to this thing where, you know, they're scrolling internet porn eight, nine ten times or hours a day. And then they're wondering like why this isn't effective for them anymore, whereas it was before. And there's an additional issue with pornography, which is not often discussed, which is that remember guys in particular, the brain is a learning prediction machine. And if I'm not trying to say that all pornography is bad, but there are good data to support the idea that if your brain learns to be aroused by watching other people have sex, it is not necessarily going to carry over to the ability to get aroused when you're one-on-one -on -one with somebody else, right? The, it, especially young kids who are consuming a lot of pornography, the brain is learning sexual arousal to other people having sex. So you're sex. going to program yourself into being a voyeur. Or, yeah, or just create challenges in, in sexual interactions with, uh, you know, with, with peers, uh, with, a, with a real partner. Right? Mary Harrington has the three laws of porno dynamics, and the second law of porno dynamics is the law of fap entropy. And it says that whatever you start out wanking to will get progressively more intense over time. And I think that this is sort of speaking to that ever, ever sort of escalating amount of um, the wildness that you need to watch in order to get an ever decreasing stimulus that comes back yeah and you know here i'm i'm approaching this only through the lens of biology right i'm not a you know i'm not a psychologist and i'm certainly not um political in it in any way at least not i have ideas about politics but i just don't discuss them publicly but the but the idea here is that you know i'm not saying pornography as a stimulus is bad or good what i'm saying is it in its availability and it's extreme forms it's a very potent stimulus and very potent stimuli of any kind extremely palatable food extreme pornography um extreme experiences like bungee cord jumping those set a threshold for dopamine release and anna will tell you that and i'm sure she did that the higher the dopamine peak the bigger the drop afterwards and it's not that you drop to baseline you drop below baseline so Again, it's not, these things aren't good or bad. They just have to be controlled in a way because when people are pursuing dopamine peaks over and over and over and they aren't getting them, typically it's because they've been pursuing that activity far too often. And you're saying perhaps take a break from that and there may be uh, an ability for yourself, your system to reset. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in theory, all the things that we're talking about with pornography could be superimposed onto food or could be superimposed onto real sex, right? Um, that one also has to be cautious there, right? But the cycling back and forth between dopamine and low dopamine states, dopamine fasting as it were, but maybe just low dopamine states, these are natural rhythms that existed in the nervous system. We have to remember what the dopaminergic system is there for. I'll say it again, I wasn't consulted at the design phase, but we know as a, as a generic form of motivation and pursuit. You can imagine the human or the animal that's hungry or thirsty. It needs energy to go pursue the thing. So the idea that you have to eat in order to get energy, that's true, but you need energy in order to get the thing to eat. So our nervous system has energy also, that's dopamine and epinephrine. Yes, we use glucose and glycogen, et cetera, when we're pursuing things, but the idea here is you're pursuing something and then either by smell or by sight, you think you're on the right track. So you go down that track and then, ah, there it is, you know, you get some berries or you get, you know, let's get prehistoric about this, or you get to kill the prey and eat it. And then it gives you energy to continue this pursuit or to reproduce. I mean, there's a reason why humans and other animals seek out reproduction is that every, every species, but certainly humans have two innate desires built into them, whether or not they decide to actualize this or not, is the desire to protect young and make more of its own species. Every successful species does that. Even if people don't have Children, in general, people care about children because they, of what they represent. Very few people dislike children. I mean, there are a few mutants out there that dislike children, but you always worry about those kinds of people. Yeah. You were talking earlier on about the fact that dopamine can be released 
when you set yourself a little goal and then achieve it. And one of the ways that you encourage your grad students is to give them a little bit of reward earlier on so that it keeps them motivated. Is this the same mentality that works during an endurance event when you want to say, I'm just got to get myself to the next lamppost. I've just got to get myself to that hill over there. Is that the same dynamic? Yeah, um, we can call it milestoning. You just set some milestone. And the key thing here is that, and this is the beauty of the dopamine system, just like the stress system is generic, the fear system is generic. It's designed for a bunch of different scenarios. The motivation system is also generic. It can be to achieve the next lamppost as a milestone, or it can be five miles as the next milestone. You get to control that. And it, so it's completely arbitrary, right? I mean, in the, one of the most brilliant things that was ever said to me by an extremely skilled psychoanalyst is so simple, and yet I do think it's the most fundamental thing to understanding oneself is that it's all internal. Right? If you finish a marathon in first place, no one comes along and drips dopamine in your ear. You self-generate that. It's all internal. It's all about your internal representation. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't good and bad events in life, but the fact of the matter is that if you set the next milestone as just outside the distance of what you're comfortable with and you make it there, if you allow yourself a moment to register that win, you get energy to do to then set the next milestone and achieve it that energy is dopamine converted into epinephrine into adrenaline and this is why you hear these incredible heroic stories like i mean i think the movie sorry i i hate to say it but the movie was less good than the book but like lone survivor the marcus luttrell story and the actually i think today or yesterday might be the anniversary of operation red wing so all those guys sadly died except marcus and, you know, you, he, in the movie, he sort of, it's like fast forward to where he, I don't want to give it away, but where he basically is the lone survivor. But in the book, it's crazy. I mean, the guy dragged himself on elbows and knees for miles and miles and miles, right? You know, th that kind of ability where you hear about people walking on stubs to, you know, these incredible feats of human um, endurance and willingness to persist, I mean, those people were able to do that not because of glycogen or they drank their goo or whatever the triathletes are always using. It's because of nervous system energy, the ability to continue to manufacture adrenaline and keep going. And the, and the extent to which that can continue is no one will ever know. I do believe that humans have a tremendous capacity to endure and persist, but that few human beings actually know how to tap into that system except under conditions of extreme survival. And you also hear from really good physicians, ones that aren't into woo biology or woo psychology at all, that to some extent, yes, there are people that unfortunately die in their battle against cancer, no matter what, but that the, the desire to continue living is a powerful force in and of itself. There may be spiritual components, there may be, I, that's not the business I'm in, uh, you know, so and how, I don't know the experiment I would do to test it. But almost certainly, setting of milestones and the ability to generate dopamine and adrenaline is what allows people to persist and live longer. There's no question about that. One of the best books that I've read this year is The Expectation Effect by David Robson. Oh, I need to so he is a science writer from the UK, and he looked at a whole bunch of studies. The placebo effect, which everybody is familiar with, right? There is a particular expectation that an outcome is going to come from some sort of medication, and lo and behold, that outcome manifests. He found this across pretty much every area of anything that you care to care about. So my two favorite studies from this, so, so interesting. He realized that uh, gluten intolerance, self-report gluten intolerance has increased from 3% to 30% in 10 years. So this is the, why there's so many gluten-free options on the menu? They've got 30% of the population to serve, yeah, so people need it. And he was wondering, well, what is it? How, how, human biology hasn't changed that much. Is it maybe that the foods have changed and people are responding to that? Or is it maybe some sort of expectation because the uh, type of news stories that are hearing about gluten and about how bad it is for us and inflammation and all this sort of stuff, Maybe it's that and people are expecting it. So they brought people into a, a lab and they sit them down. These people do and do not have uh, self-reported gluten intolerances and they give everybody the same meal. They tell everybody in the room that it's got gluten in it. It's got no gluten in it. After a while, people who don't have a gluten intolerance biologically, who haven't eaten gluten, have diarrhea, they have hives, they're breaking out in inflammation, they're having to run to the bathroom. Okay, well, that, that, that's kind of interesting. He did another, uh, another uh, story that he spoke about. 
VO2 max tests that they were looking at, apparently there's a particular genetic mutation that allows people to blow off CO2 and upregulate oxygen in a better way. Uh, they brought people in, even numbers of people that did and did not have this genetic trait, split them into two random groups. So there was a mix of both do and do not have the trait in each. First group was told, you've got the right genetic trait. You should be really, really good at this. Second group was told, oh, sorry, you don't have it. You shouldn't be too good. No surprise, perhaps, at the group that was told that they did, they ended up performing better. But when they actually looked at what was happening in the physiology of these people, they found that the people who didn't have the genetic mutation but were told that they did had a lower overall lactate threshold. They had a lower overall heart rate. They were blowing off CO2 more effectively and upregulating oxygen better than the people who did have the genetic mutation but were told that they didn't. So he coined this term that said your expectations are even more powerful than your genes. I love that. I'm going to read that book. I That's a remarkable example. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot these days is being made of epigenetic effects and things. But this is almost in the different direction. This is a psychophysiological response. Uh, I find this kind of thing, to be honest, among the more fascinating and interesting aspects of neuroscience, if not the most interesting lately, um, those examples are tremendous, so I, I can't uh, counter those at all with anything more spectacular. But the, the work of Dr. Uh, Aliyah Crum at Stanford, she runs the Stanford Mind Body Lab, and she's done simple experiments, but they're really elegant, um, instructing people, one group, all about the terrible effects of stress. It destroys your immune system, et cetera, et cetera. Other people telling them also true things, but all the positive effects of stress. It sharpens your ability of function, you can remember things better, et cetera, et cetera. You see exactly what you are told, basically. Now, you can't lie to people. You can't tell them things that aren't true. It's just about the subset of information that you get dictates the response you get. And perhaps the most dramatic was they gave two different groups of people, and then they actually each got the opposite condition too, a milkshake. One group is told this milkshake is very high calorie. It contains a lot of fat and sugar, et cetera. Another group is told uh, the milkshake they're getting is very low calorie. It's very nutrient sparse, et cetera. Then they measure hunger. So to how long it takes for them to get hungry again after ingesting it. They also look at insulin and they also look at ghrelin, this a hormone that is secreted um, as you get, essentially makes you hungry. It's associated with hunger. There are other things too, but you see exactly what you would expect, which is that people that get the nutrient dense milkshake are satisfied for longer, their ghrelin is suppressed and their insulin is higher. And you see the opposite in the group that had the, the so-called low calorie shake. Turns out it's the exact same milkshake. Uh, this is remarkable, right? Because this is not simply the placebo effect. I think it's the placebo effect plus the expectation effect plus a real physiological effect because that's what you describe as well. And the way that Ali, Dr. Ali Crum, as she, she uh, goes by, the way she describes it is that any event causes a real physiological response, but that real physiological response is braided in with our expectation and our understanding of what the response ought to be to create the actual response. So it's sort of real plus perceived equals Actualized. your reality. Yes. Right, exactly. And so um, I love this kind of thing, as you can tell. I'm, I'm eating up the example that, uh, that you gave. I think it's spectacular because what it means is that, no, we can't lie to ourselves. We can't tell ourselves that, you know, drinking water is going to sustain us just as food would for, uh, for five days. We're not going to be hungry. But to some extent, if one understands that, well, you can survive a long time on just water yeah. and you don't need to eat, then you might experience less hunger. That's the way the nervous system works. Well, you can definitely survive longer on just water if you believe that you can survive longer on just water. There is no reason not to believe this. So I was really, really averse to the whole... Rhonda Byrne, the secret woo, sending out messages to the universe. And David uh, positions himself very anti that as well in the book. Um, but you can't deny the fact that the positive thinking has a real physiological impact on what you do. He was talking about, um, they did a study with older people uh, that were past retirement, and they asked them to use, what, what sort of words do you associate with getting older? And they split these people into two different groups. And the sort of words that people used perfectly mapped onto how long they were going to live. So the people that used the sort of words alone, frail, fragile, injury, death, they were the ones that lived the shortest. The people that said, um, 
happiness, freedom, liberty, connection, uh, maturity, th th those sorts of words were the ones that lived the longest. So your expectations can literally impact your longevity. There's, I, I'm yet to read the book in detail, but I've talked to a guy named Ethan Cross. He wrote a book called He's Chatter. He's been on the show. Oh, He's fantastic. Show okay. weeks I think that internal chatter world is a very interesting one that neuroscience will eventually have something to, to say uh, about. Uh, I think the most powerful mindset, uh, at least to me, is one that, again, I, I learned from Ali Crum. Um, this is a mindset that in her peer-reviewed studies of different populations, it's clear exists um, universally in people in the SEAL teams, but um, less so, or is perhaps even absent from the general population, sadly. The idea that stress grows you, that challenge grows you, but isn't the only way that you can grow. I think is a very powerful mindset. So, what do you mean, do you mean by that? So, they, she, what they did is she surveyed a bunch of different um, people, different professions, and asked, you know, what's your view of stress? Do you think it grows you? It diminishes your ability, et cetera. So, this isn't giving people information. This is asking them for information. And the only group that said stress grows you, the more challenged, the better you get, et cetera. The more stress you experience, the more likely you are to to succeed. Was the this group from the SEAL teams? I don't know if they were new recruits or if they had been in a long time, but that was the the, the group. I would add to that, that yes, if you adopt the mindset that stress grows you, you're going to be much better off, but also that stress is not the only way to grow in life, right? There's this idea, you know, we have this, and again, there's sort of a gravitational pull of this, idea, like stress grows, you, yes. you know, forward center of mass, or, you know, yep. always be in friction, limbic yep. friction, limbic yep. friction. How about a, a more a, a expansive or nuanced version of that might be, stress grows you. So if you're under stress, you're back on your heels from something, you think, okay, how can I get flat footed or even forward center of mass? You tell yourself, stress grows me, stress grows me, stress grows me. But that doesn't mean stress is the only thing that will grow you, right? Learning to cycle between periods of hard work and deep, what I call non-destructive, uh, deliberate reset, right? Um, that's what really works over time. I can attest to that. You know, I, people who just really go out and tie one on in order to, to recover, you can only get away with that for a few years before your body and mind start to give out, right? So find non-destructive ways to reset and also adopt the mindset that stress grows you and adopt the mindset that, you know, there are other ways to grow that don't involve stress. And I think you're set up to have a pretty fantastic life. That's my, you know, simple view of, of the way these things work. Speaking of endurance and suffering, what have you learned from Lex Friedman since you've been friends with him? <laughs> the guy works a lot. You can text him or call him at pretty much any hour except um, the early morning hours that he happens to be in because he's likely to be asleep. You know, Lex is, an, is a really interesting one um, because, you know, like a lot of scientists and engineers, he, ha he has that ability to really drop into the trench, which is certainly not unique to scientists and engineers, but is really helpful. I think you know, Lex comes at things from a from at once a very engineering physics perspective, which you know, obviously computer science, robots and all AI and all that. He loves that stuff. But you know, there's a phrase that he's used over and over again in our conversations. And he's talked about this publicly that I've started to pay a bit more attention to because he says it so many times, which is, you know, approach life with love in your heart, you know, which is weird, right? You think about an engineer who's thinking like this goes there and this is what's gonna predict the best outcome. And then you think like approach things with love in your heart. And I think he's right. Because, and I think that is very powerful because there are so many pitfalls. And by pitfalls, what I mean are energy sinks. There, you know, across the day from the time you wake up until you go to sleep at night, there's so many places for you to put your energy. It can go into online battles, it can go into, uh, you know, texting five different people, it can be investing in one person, it can be, there's so many things. And so much of success in any domain is about. Yes, maintaining focus. We hear about that a lot. Focus, focus, focus. But what is focus? Focus is really about not allowing energy to dissipate into these kind of meaningless trails. So I think about Lex and I, as I do for all people, I think, you know, what animal does he best represent or what animal best represents him? I, I think of all people like this. I have this kind of weird process where after I spend some time with somebody, it just pops to mind. Like, I can't tell you what animal comes to mind yet. You might you. see that after the ice bath later on. We'll see how long I <laughs> yeah, stay. You might, be, you might be a polar bear, um, super comfortable in the water, um, the cold water. But I think that, you know, at some point I realized that, that Lex is, gets very fixated on things 
very, very fixated, but he also knows how to disengage. And he really avoids energy sinks through this and losses through this kind of love thing that he's really into. Um, because anger is very energetically demanding. It's great fuel, but it's not efficient fuel overall, right? It's, it's like having a gas tank full of fuel, but there are a lot of leaks in it. Whereas I do think that doing things out of genuine desire, there's a calm sort of energized balance that comes with that. And you feel like you can go forever. So this is starting to sound a little bit woo. It sounds like, oh, you know, the heart is more powerful than the adrenals. And look, they're both powerful. The adrenals can keep you alive and enduring for a long, long time. But if you do things out of anger and friction for too long, your immune system will crash. We know this. But it is essentially infinite how much energy you can derive out of genuine desire to engage with something or somebody. What it's, animal is he then? You know, Lex, well, his hair makes me think he's some spiky thing. He's sort of like, he's some, he sort of has the, like the persistence of the porcupine, but he has, he definitely has, I think he, as much as I don't want to admit it, because I wish it were me, not him, but I think the animal that best captures Lex, because he's also a bit of a loner, is the Wolverine. I've spent a lot of time thinking about actual Wolverines, not the Hugh Jackman version of Wolverines, but the actual <laughs> Wolverines. They're very solo animals, unless they pair up to mate. They are incredibly strong. He is freakishly strong. I've done jujitsu with him. I'm not good at jujitsu. He is. He's a black belt jujitsu, but he is freakishly strong. So if I had to pick an animal, I'd say probably um, the Wolverine. What's interesting about him, I went to uh, Thanksgiving with him last year, which was my first time of enjoying that holiday here, which is a fantastic holiday, I actually think. We don't have something in the UK where people sit back and do that gratitude reflection period uh, except for Christmas you know people do that end of year review but I really think and especially the time of year it's in it's perfect so we were talking and he was talking about the fact that he was working hard but he feels this gap between where he is and where he could be which I Sounds like Lex. sense is a common uh, pattern yeah and he was saying that a lot of the friends that he speaks to will say you know you're doing well you're working hard and he looked me in the eyes and he's like, I don't want them to say that. I want them to tell me to suck it up. I want them to tell me that I need to stop being such a pussy and keep going. I was like, it takes an unbelievably singular person to work as hard as he does. I don't think that the internet, whatever people know about how hard he works is only a small sliver of just how obsessive and, and committed he is. And for him to say that he wants to be around more people that push him in that way, it made me realize that perhaps uh, I could be offering more to my friends as well, that offering them just sort of support in the form of acceptance and, and, and presence and I'm hearing you and dude, you're doing great or whatever reassurance in that way, maybe isn't always the best way to go about things. So yeah, that was, it's just something that stuck in my mind. It's something, it's a little model that I've kept with me where I'm thinking, look, does my friend need me to tell him that he's doing good? Or does he need me to tell him to suck it up and get his nose down because I know that he can do it? Sounds very much like Lex. I'm learning about your, your internal workings a bit too. There are three kinds of reward. Two of them are often discussed. One is rarely discussed, and, but is pretty powerful. And I think it's useful to think about toggling between these different rewards, whether or not for ourselves or whether or not in trying to uh, stimulate and motivate other people. One, of course, is reward. You did great. Congratulations. That was awesome. Loved that podcast great that you got an A plus on your report card or B plus because last year you got a C, whatever it is, reward. Then there's punishment, right? This is obvious. You screwed up, like you take something away or you take the anticipation of reward away, whatever it is. You screwed up, you're punished, you're grounded, et cetera. You're not watching TV for a month or whatever it is, no screens for a month. Then there's the third kind of reward, which is the reward that you hang out in front of somebody at a distance, like a carrot on a stick out in front of them, which is not reward for what they've accomplished, but reward that they can anticipate if they accomplish something. I think this could be very effective in the context that we're talking about it, which is how would I do this with Lex? I'd say, you know, I really loved this particular interview. If only the next time you have that person on, you also ask them this, right? That's not a punishment. You're not saying it sucked because it didn't include this. You're not saying it wasn't great. You're saying if next time you were to do that, I think it would be even better. So you're hanging a potential reward out in front. 
And I think that can be a very powerful motivator. So you can, you know, we could build up a number of different examples around this, but this is not often talked about in sort of reward, punishment, schedules, and motivation. We always think reward and punishment, but we think immediate reward, immediate punishment. Now, in terms of building habits and goal setting and goal seeking, we know that visualizing failure is, for better or for worse, is a far better motivator than visualizing success if you want to get people motivated to start, right? To start. Now, getting people to continue involves regular rewards for reaching milestones. However, and I should have said this earlier, I want to make sure that we do emphasize that the best schedule really is random intermittent reinforcement. So if you're setting milestones on this run or in your intellectual pursuits or business pursuits or relationship pursuits, if you set a milestone and you get there, you do want to have a little bit of an internal celebration. Remember, it's all internal. So internal celebration, not extrinsic celebration and reward. But every once in a while, it's good to just not reward yourself. Now, at what ratio should you do that? Well, the, the computer modeling data say that the optimal ratio of success, successful trials and uh, unsuccessful trials for learning and motivation is going to be about 85% of the time to reward yourself and about 15% of the time to not reward yourself. So random intermittent lack of reward is another way to think about it. And I talked about this with Jocko a little bit and he thought, oh yeah, the, probably what we should do is have workouts where it's a big uh, fish bowl full of ping pong balls yeah, and, and about 15% of them are marked with reward. But the other ones is you do something and you get to go take a ping pong ball out and if you take that out, then you get some reward if it's marked and if it's not, then you don't. And rather than every time you accomplish something, you go reward yourself. So here we're talking, we're getting kind of into the weeds of reward schedules. But I think if you really want to support a friend, punishment you should use very judiciously. Although if they really screw up, a good friend, as they say, will put um, the friendship ahead of the friend or the friend ahead of the friendship, excuse me. Um, The friend, like you're going to tell them what they really need to hear, even if it compromises the friendship, if you really believe they need to hear that. Other times reward, like that was awesome, congratulations. And then... Occasionally, if it's warranted, that was great-ish, but it would be so much better if the next time you did this. Or that was great, but, you know, honestly, I think it was a mixture of good and, and not so good. So I think those are three powerful ways to reward, and they can be mixed up and toggled back and forth according to whatever schedule allows that person to continue. What does your morning routine look like at the moment? Morning routine is wake up. If I... Run about, what, run about what time? Uh, I'm waking up these days around 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. I'm trying to go to sleep by about 10.30 p.m. Sometimes it's 11, sometimes it's 10. I wake up, um, and I have to be careful here because whenever I've described my routine in a little bit of detail, people always say, I can't believe you don't go to the bathroom. And it's like, well, of course. I, I, so I, <laughs> I put be, my pants yeah, on. Exactly, my right on. foot, left foot. So yeah. I want to be clear. I, yeah, I take care of my basic functions. Um, but when I wake up, I make a beeline for sunlight. Uh, so I'm going to get sunlight in my eyes for the, you know, I'll probably go into the grave saying this. So forgive me if people have heard me say this before, but the single best thing you can do for your sleep, your energy, your mood, your wakefulness, your metabolism (laughs) is to get natural light in your eyes early in the day. Don't wear sunglasses to do it. It takes about 10 minutes or so. Um, if you live in a cloudy area, if you're in the UK in the winter, Yes, or the summer, or the summer. Maybe you resort to some artificial light as a replacement, but as much as one can, get bright, natural, and if not natural, artificial light in your eyes early in the day, without sunglasses, contacts, and eyeglasses are fine. Don't try and do it through a window or windshield; it's going to take far too long. This sets in motion a huge number of different neurobiological and and hormonal cascades that are good for you, reduces stress late at night, offsets cortisol, a million different things really that are good for you. So I get that. And yes, sometimes- Is that a walk? Doing a little walk? Ideally that would be a walk, but sometimes we'll just go into the yard and have some coffee and, and you know, soak in whatever sunlight through, through the clouds. If it's a cloudy overcast day, it might be 20, 30 minutes. If it's a, um, if it's a very bright day, it might just be a few minutes. But really the, the quality studies on humans that have looked at this say, try and get as much natural light as you can in the morning hours, whenever it is that that is for you, especially the first three hours after waking. If you can work outside, great. If you can get near a window, because as opposed to just in a dark conference room, that's better. But if you can get outside, that would be fantastic. So I, I get sunlight. 
I hydrate, I drink water, and then yerba mate is my favorite form of coffee, uh, excuse me, caffeine. Are you waiting, how long are you waiting from 90 waiting? 90 to 120 minutes. Are you doing any salts during that time? Are you taking any electrolytes in? I, I am a fan of water with element. Yep. Before I had element packets, I would just take a little bit of, of sea salt or, yep. or pink salt. What's your favorite element flavor? I like them all. There's one I don't like. I'm not a fan of the chocolate one, but I Me like neither. the, yeah. Some people love it. Uh, my podcast producer, his wife loves that. Uh, so I give it to her, the chocolate mint one. But um, I like the raspberry, the um, the citrus one. I love that stuff. Mango but, chili is, have you opened the mango chili and breathed in shortly afterwards? It's like being pepper sprayed. No, it's absolutely it. insane. It's like, it. it's like being blasted in the face. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's just the best way. That cold glass of water and that first thing in the morning. And I mean, it was you who uh, reassured me of the, what I thought was bro science about your adenosine system not being active for the first 90 minutes. And if you're going to pump, pump caffeine onto that, you're not really actually acting on that. Your adrenal system is the one that you need to be looking mm -hmm. at, optimal U hydration, all that sort of stuff. It's just such a good way to start the day. So, okay, we've got um, 90 minutes deep. What have you been doing yeah. in that? You've had your light in the eyes. What have you been doing between that and the yerba mate in 90 minutes? I do everything I can to not do email, not do social media, and to take care of a few critical tasks. These days, I'm, I have this obsession with trying to do one cognitively hard thing a day, one, and one physically hard thing a day. Now, it does it not extreme physical, not David Goggins level workouts or anything, but um, in that 90 minutes, I'll typically try and read a research article start to finish, or I'll work on a document that I might be doing a grant or research paper or planning a podcast or researching a podcast. I try and get my brain into kind of a linear mode. I try and narrow that aperture. Because if I don't, the distraction that's created by social media and interactions with others can kind of wick out into the rest of the day. So I'm not necessarily trying to finish something in that time, but I try and do something challenging. I experience great pleasure from battling through something mentally challenging, but that's something that I built up since my university years when I was about you know 19 or so, got serious about school and really started to experience the, the deep pleasure of like, ah, oh, I figured that out, or like, that was really tough. I don't always succeed, but that's what I'm doing in that hour to 90 minutes. But I confess, sometimes we'll take a walk during that time and maybe talk through some things that are that are challenging, you know, or, or sometimes I get lazy and, and I'm, I'll miss a day of that cognitive challenge. Then I do caffeine about um, 90 to 120 minutes um, after waking. And even though I prefer to work out earlier, I generally will then do some sort of physical workout. I have a very consistent routine. I've done it for 30 years where I weight train for 45 or minutes to an hour every other day. And occasionally I take an extra day off mm. and occasionally due to travel or other commitments, I'll occasionally double up two days and then take two days off. Yep. So it's really boring, you know, talk about workout schedules, but it's really simple. It's like, you know, I'll do a, uh, kind of pushing day, rest, pulling day, upper body, push up, rest, upper body, pull, rest, and then legs take two days off, something like that. Are you doing on the off days, are you doing some sort of zone three? Always jogging or skipping rope. Those are my favorite forms of cardio, sometimes swimming, but typically I'll go running for 30 to 45 minutes. Or if I'm feeling a little bit lazier, because I always find the high intensity stuff to be easier than the long drawn out stuff. I'll sometimes throw on a, a weight vest, a 30 or 50 pound weight vest, and I'll go out for a shorter run. Or I'll, I'm a big fan of knees over toes. Ben Patrick, I know you in had him show, on. Yeah, great we, guy. we were down in Costa Rica with him and his wife who had the best time and learned so much. Um, I'll occasionally um, do a backwards, you know, hill walk um, or throw on the weight vest for that. Um, we sometimes will get bands and we'll tap. So there's a great way to combine this. We will sometimes get two people in one of these thick bands, do hill walks in the morning while getting our sunlight. Yeah. As, but that I don't really consider a workout. I consider that just kind of rehabilitative movement. as a movement. So yeah. on the off days, I'm doing cardio. And sometimes that's in the morning. Sometimes that's in the evening. I do not like to weight train in the second half of the day because I like to be really caffeinated when I weight train. I like to listen to loud, fast music. Most of the time, not always. I keep my phone out or off of for most workouts. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Podcasts maybe if I'm running, yep. but I really try hard when I'm working out to just focus on the workout. 
And those workouts, the weight training workouts are always 10 minutes or so of warm up, and then no more than 40 to 50 minutes of really hard work. If I do train hard any longer, I don't recover enough to be able to come in a few days later. And when I train that way, I generally make pretty consistent progress. And you're taking yourself up until what's that? Probably maybe 10, 30, 11 a.m., something like that? Now? Yeah, and then I'll eat my first real meal. Now, occasionally I'll wake up really hungry if I didn't eat that well the night before. Yeah. But typically, the after I train, I... Yeah, I'll eat. I like oatmeal after I train. Oatmeal, fruit, some fish oil, protein drink. And then maybe 90 to 120 minutes after that, I'll have a real lunch. My lunch is pretty much the biggest meal of the day. If I have my way, it'll be a steak, a salad, maybe a little more starch, although I sort of got it earlier. Yep. Um, Brazil nuts. And that meal sometimes can extend longer and longer. <laughs> I love to being eat. A feeding fast, I love yeah. to eat. Yeah. So I'll eat. And then I confess, I usually will work a little bit more for about 30 minutes or an hour, typically email. And then I'll take a um, 10 to 30 minute yoga nidra nap or a nap mm -hmm. and then come back refreshed. Um, I really struggle with the naps, man. I come back after that and I'm, my emotions are all over the place. I'm disoriented. Maybe it's because I struggle to fall asleep super quickly and therefore I'm extending that period out for a little bit longer than I need. I probably need to try the yoga nidra thing. But for me, it's, it, I'm absolutely all over if I do that. I wake up and I, I don't know what day it is and my emotions always feel a little bit out of whack as well. I wake up grumpy from naps sometimes, I'm told. Okay. There are a few times when I've woken up just really angry. I have no idea what that's about. I don't know any of the neurochemistry associated with that. Sometimes I wake up from naps, it's really pleasant. I'll occasionally, do, if the nap is early enough in the day, afterwards I'll have a you know a nice double espresso, hmm. and get back into work. That's the hardest part of the day, actually. If I was well-structured in the early part of the day, it's that 2 or 3 p.m. The key is then to try and get something really useful done cognitively again. So some people might look at this and say, wait, you're working for an hour in the morning and 30 minutes here and an hour in the afternoon. When are you actually working? But it's really about the depth of the trench when you're working. And so if I'm going to drop into something again for a few hours in the afternoon, I'm really going to drop into it. And that's typically phone off and out of the room. And my goal is to get to the evening time so that I can do the things that I want in the yep. evening. Yep. I can enjoy, like I'm always setting a goal of the next time block. So this is something I've been doing for a long time, but even more so lately. I don't think my goal in the next hour is to do blank. I think this is dopamine uh, reward predictions uh, in action. I think, okay, if I get this workout done, then I'll be able to eat at more or less the same time, which I enjoy, and then something else will happen. So I'm very focused on what I'm doing, but I'm doing it for the purposes of like opening up the next door to the next thing. So if I can get that afternoon work block done, I'm thinking, ah, if I can just really get this podcast recorded, yeah. which I enjoy. Is that your usual time to record, middle of the afternoon? Well, it used to be in the morning, but I'm getting, I'm putting more and more preparation into them all the time. My poor podcast producer, he's like, you know, I always joke that the one thing these podcasts probably will succeed in doing, meaning my podcast is they're going to cure insomnia because some of them are so damn long. But I experience so much pleasure from spending a week or two researching something and then putting some structure on. And as you know, I mean, podcasting is its own, its own sort of natural drug. Uh, it just feels good if you enjoy doing this sort of thing. Um, so typically we're starting late in the day now and going so till pretty late. For me, the problem that I have, so I'm fasted right now, we're what? one minute to 4 p.m. You haven't uh, eaten anything today? No, no nothing. Goodness gracious. So, but that's the only way. If I eat, I've, my thoughts become slower. I'm not as verbally articulate. Mm -hmm. I'm nowhere near as agile. Now, I could push this super, super late, I'm sure, and it would be probably a pretty bad idea. Maybe I could avoid, maybe I could go protein and fat or just mostly protein earlier on, and that would have avoided. But I just find that my thoughts and my verbal articulation just goes through the toilet. It's adrenaline. If you, I mean, I think that, sorry to interrupt you, but if you ingest a bunch of glucose or, you know, I think you're getting that. I mean, you've got to have a nice, I'm guessing that if we were to tap your vein right now, if we could do microdialysis on your brain, that you have a nice, low, but steady level of adrenaline. And listen, this adrenaline thing, this dopamine thing is no joke. This is the stuff of human evolution, right? This is the, these are the same neurochemicals. This is the, this is the energy drink of human evolution. This is not the rock star, Red Bull, et cetera. That stuff just hijacks this very system. I'm not saying it's bad. It's just feeding this very same system. So if you find an eating schedule or a fasting schedule that allows you to tap into that as a resource, oof, I don't care what anyone says about whether or not fasting will make you live longer or not. Who knows, right? Who, if you're in the control group, you know what's going to happen. So, but everyone, presumably everyone dies eventually. So pick your pick your mode of eating, be my guest. But if you figured out a way to tap into this, 
in a way that works for you, by all means, leverage that. Because until somebody comes along and says that intermittent fasting is unhealthy, well then to me, it seems, at least for me, eating between 11 p.m., uh, excuse me, 11 a.m.-ish and 8 p.m.-ish is great. And what I can also tell you is that having a consistent meal schedule, meaning a feeding window, we absolutely know, I don't know why this isn't discussed more, we absolutely know that that helps anchor your sleep schedule. And having a sl anchored sleep schedule helps anchor your light viewing schedule. And a light viewing, so it all starts to, to piece together. I think that what's lost in the discussion about nutrition, except for the fact that most online discussions about nutrition are carried out by they're people. They're religious. Well, they're religious, but they also seem to be carried out by people that have like, I don't know, like, like real feelings of powerlessness in themselves. Like it comes through, like, because they're quibbling over like a, whether or not you should eat a cracker or not, or whether or not, you know, um, inhaling oxygen, you know, westward is going to break your fast or not. I'm, sorry, I'm, I'm obviously I once joking. Saw, I once saw, I saw David Sinclair came on my show twice and he's a, he's a fantastic human. I know you're friends with him. And um, he talked about the fact that his resveratrol goes into a small amount of fatty yogurt, I think, because mm -hmm. it's like brick That's dust, does, right? Yeah. So you need to mix it in and it's homemade yogurt and something else and something else. And it's like, the, it's, it's a shot of yogurt, right? It's enough for him to put his little capsule of resveratrol in and the comments were alight with people oh, yeah. saying that's not a fast. real fast this is hilarious. because you've got... It's so sad. Uh, you know, it's so sad that we can't have a nuanced conversation about nutrition online. That, well, let's, let's be fair. Calories in, calories out applies, right? I don't think the laws of thermodynamics have disappeared. Um, and yet you have people who would argue that it doesn't. And okay, like we'll let them have their, their arguments. I think that the, the key thing is when you find an eating schedule that works for the other things that you need to do in life, yep. it's really beautiful. Because then you really start to exert some control over these energy systems. What we're talking about is focus and defocus. We're talking about focus and deliberate decompression, but not it's yoga nidra or a nap or simply a walk. Um, and food, as you point out, is a wonderful source of caloric energy. We need it at some point, but it also can create this parasympathetic response where we feel very tired, especially if you don't eat for long periods of time and then you eat substantial amount of starches, you will feel like calmer and more relaxed. And so, and maybe sleepy and maybe brain foggy. Mm. So I, I've been, you know, of course, assaulted by this for this online. I do tend to eat some more starches in the evenings and fewer proteins. And sure, you can show me 20 double blind placebo controlled or randomized controlled trials saying that if you're going to eat starches, you should eat them in the early part of the day. Well, I do that too after I train. But ultimately what I'm interested in doing is maintaining the kind of bodily health and aesthetic that I'm looking for, my blood lipids that I'm looking for. But I want to accomplish things in life. So I think if one gets too distracted by what's possible with nutrition, it can be, it can really take somebody off target. No one ever succeeded in creating anything useful in terms of work or relationships by overly focusing on changing their dietary intake. But so once it works, so what, once something works for you, I say, just stick lean with into it. it, just lean into it. And that can change over time. So that can really change over time. Do you know Alex Hormozy? You familiar with him? Sounds familiar. Really hot shit on the internet at the moment. This sort of gym bro who has founded this company and is now moving on to bigger and better things. He's eaten, I'm pretty sure he's eaten the same lunch for 10 years or something. He always has the same lunch and he's got the exact same uh, thought process uh, around this that you do. If you were to, going back to the morning routine thing, if you were to design or if you were to instruct someone to do the worst possible things in the morning to set their day up for failure, what would they be? Uh, wake up and stay in bed. Uh, well, wait, there are good reasons to stay in bed in the morning. But once those are completed, then staying in bed is... Curtains drawn. Yeah, curtains drawn. Just using your... Passively scrolling on social media. Um, like there, are even, like, there are neurobiological data showing that when you are upright you actually are stimulating this area of the brain called locus ceruleus. Whereas when you recline, you actually are less alert. Literally the position of your body dictates some of your levels of alertness. So That's you why you suggest uh, people to not sit like this uh, at their work desk, right? Yes, and if, you're look and if you're looking down while working, you're actually less alert than you could be if 
your eyes are averted slightly over and nasal most people level, that are on their phone including me and the postural stuff is really bad too i mean i'm getting i'm trying to really combat that internal rotation you know that the c-shaped human kind of thing you know um it's really not good i'm really trying I, in fact one this is so common now the c-shaped human thing that um it almost feels strange to, to be upright you know like people that get exactly the open yeah. uh the the uh sort of external rotation is, is good for us we know this but in bed i would say in phone. bed so people are on their phone they're in bed they're, they're not getting enough light or they just artificial light or they're trying to get the sunlight through the window terrible um they are then going and sitting and getting into like hip you know hip flexor contraction um they're drinking coffee too early in the day uh they aren't getting into any kind of movement but it's mostly about the sort of randomization of activities you're sort of making a cup of coffee while texting um, not getting sunlight, you know, then they're scattering that in with like a little bit of work, but then something hits that's stressful and they're diverting their attention. They're sort of building in this eight attention deficit like disorder through mm, behavior. So they're doing, they're not single tasking, they're not monotasking, and they're not being deliberate or intentional with the things that they're doing. They're just allowing the morning to kind of come and take them wherever the wind blows. That's right. And I have to say, even though I describe my routine accurate, my morning routine accurately, if I were to really optimize it, and I, I've done this from time to time, I would get up, I would hydrate, and I would immediately exercise. I would use that early, you know, peaking of the cortisol response that comes with waking to get the body into action, sort of Jocko Willink style, right, 4.30. I always see his posts, but I see them at 7 a.m. Yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> precisely. Yeah. Um, so, you know. So the, Jocko was up before me again today. Yeah, yeah all, he seems to always uh, beat me by a few minutes unless I wake up in the middle of the night for a moment. But uh, to really get into action, because that's going to generate its own dopamine and adrenaline response anytime i've worked out really early like if i have a flight and then you know and then moved into the other components of my day i find that i feel better all day long i i also will say if i work out really early maybe between 7 and 8 a.m well then my first meal might land at 9 a.m yeah. so you, you know you need to be flexible with some of these things but the general principles uh, apply i noticed that you haven't put cold exposure into your morning routine i'm gonna guess you must have a cold tub of some kind you have a cold tub and a sauna i've been less good about that lately the best time to do that for me is on my cardio days i do it after the because run. you don't want to do it post hypertrophy because you're going to blunt some of the responses that are actually you're trying to get by the the workout itself that's okay. right and um, i have one i should say i have one rest day per week where i don't do any cardio or weight training i really like doing having a complete rest day but on that complete rest day if i can i'll do 20 minutes of sauna and then cold for three minutes 20 minutes of sauna and then cold i'll make the rest day reparative yep. and generally we make that social where we're talking about things and and we're very social in our working out like we we talk uh, my partner and I talk while we work out. I, you know, when it's set, when it's time to do a set, I become a little bit of like the drill sergeant. So like, let's do your set, do your set. But then occasionally I'm the guy doing a set and I'm like, all right, so this afternoon we're going to, you know. Uh, but I try and I try and really focus. I, and I enjoy training by myself too, but generally we train together. And then, and then typically if we're doing ice bath or sauna, we try and coordinate those things. So I've seen a bunch of research about sauna. I've seen a bunch of research about cold exposure. Contrast therapy, which is huge here in Austin, going from sauna to cold. And it seems like 20 and three, mm -hmm. three rounds is very typical. Is there something that we're gaining or something that we're losing by doing that cycle rather than doing a block of heat and a block of cold separately? Not that I'm aware of, but you know, the, we finally have some good science to put to this. And unfortunately, it wasn't from my lab. This is the beautiful work of Susanna Soberg, who's over in Scandinavia, published a paper in Cell Reports Medicine showing that the threshold you're trying to hit each week is at least, you can do more, but at least 11 minutes of uncomfortable but safe cold exposure per week total. So that could be three minutes Monday, three minutes Wednesday, so, yep. so on, to 11 minutes and 57 minutes per week minimum. <laughs> so so of precise. Sauna. That's what they found. <laughs> What did they find? Increases brown fat thermogenesis, thereby metabolism, thereby comfort being, you know, in cold, et cetera. Um, clearly there's a resilience effect. Clearly there's a dopamine increasing effect. And clearly you can do more. You could do all that in one day or you could do, spread it out throughout the week or you could do more. It kind of depends on what you're shooting for. How cold? People always say, how cold, how hot? Well, for heat, is generally uh, between 187 degrees Fahrenheit and 212 degrees Fahrenheit somewhere in that range. And for cold, it's 
cold enough that you really want to get the hell out, but that you can stay in safely because I don't want anyone to kill themselves with doing this stuff. Did I see you say that um, evening time heat exposure increases growth hormone release by 16 times or something insane, but subsequent sessions of the same only increase it by a very small margin. Yeah, Am so I talking out of my asset? No, you're absolutely right. So we can, we can delineate some protocols. If you want to get better, more resilient, cold exposure is going to be great anytime. Post-cold exposure, your body is going to heat up. Think of your body heating up as waking up. So if you are concerned about not being able to sleep, then I would suggest you do your cold exposure earlier in the day, right? Heat does the opposite. So I'm laying out some parameters here. Heat does the opposite. You're going to heat up while you're in the deliberate heat exposure. But afterwards, there's a post heating dip in temperature. We can talk. This was all covered in an episode I did with Dr. Craig Heller on thermogenesis. Gets a little bit down in the weeds, but take my word for it. Or if you want to f- get the science, you can go there to find the science behind this. So sauna at night is great as well. Now let's think about how to combine these things. So let's say you, you, you know, you're on a, it's a Tuesday. You've done your weight training on Monday. Um, and you want to do your heat and cold. You don't have time to optimize everything perfectly. You could say, okay, I'm going to do my um, heat and cold at 10 a.m. or 8 a.m. You get in the sauna for 20 minutes or so, and then you get into the cold for three minutes. And then you might get into the sauna again for 10 minutes, and you get in the cold for another minute or so. You end on cold. Yes. Why? Because it'll wake you up, and presumably you're not you want to be woken up for the day. That also means don't then, if you're doing it in a facility, don't then go and have a warm shower. Right. Once you finished. Right. Coolish shower is fine because you want to clean off often. I mean, the ice bath is cleanish, but it's, you know, in Dep- the, depends in, where you're going. In laboratories, you're absolutely right. In laboratories, if we want to preserve something, in particular a virus, we put it in the freezer. If you want to kill a virus, you heat it up. This is not. You can have as dirty of a sauna as you want, but the, the cold tub. <laughs> well, the t- yeah, the sauna sort of its own autoclave if it gets hot enough, right? And the cold, cold stuff needs to be cleaned out now and again. You get mold growing in, an, in a freezer which is kind of freaky to think about, but you really can't. It's never going to grow in a sauna. Never going to grow if it, if it gets hot enough. Now, there is what I call the Soberg principle, uh, which is if you are using deliberate cold exposure to increase metabolism, end on cold. So finish on the cold, not just because it wakes you up more, but because then you have to heat your body up naturally, which is a thermogenic metabolic response. So end with cold, and if you really want to push it, you can do things like don't use a towel, use evaporation, uh, spread out your limbs and don't huddle so that you have to shiver more, et cetera. I mean, there are a lot of little games you can play. But let's say you want to reduce post-exercise inflammation. You're not concerned with hypertrophy gains, of, of muscle size gains or strength gains. Well, then get in the cold after your, your workout. Do that for one to, some people can do 10 minutes. Reduce inflammation. Let's say you really want to hit growth hormone, which is what you asked. The biggest effects of sauna on growth hormone, and they are big effects, are when the sauna is only done once per week, but it's done in four cycles or sets, we could say, of 30 minutes each. So that means 30 minutes in the sauna at the temperatures I described before, then a five minute break, just air cooling off or 10 minute break, then back into the sauna for 30 minutes. This is brutal. Then again in the afternoon, 30 minutes in the sauna, then 10 minutes just air cooling off and then back into the sauna for 30 minutes. So that's two hours at 187 to 212 degrees. In one day. In one day. With a maximum of what? Less than sort of 20 minutes of rest in between those little sessions than the big rest in between. So you have to be very careful, right? Heat can kill you. You got to hydrate. You need to make sure you get enough salt. Like, I mean, this is, this is work, right? Um, But you get, you see in these human studies up to 16 fold increases in growth hormone. So you can imagine this could exert some very strong reparative effect if you're training for a big event or endurance event, or, you, or maybe you're just really wiped out from the week. This is a stressor, but it's a stressor that delivers a potent growth hormone response. Now, if you do sauna more often than that, you're not going to want to do two hours a day in the sauna because presumably you're doing other things. You have a life. You have a life. And in addition to that, the growth hormone effect starts to diminish if you become too heat adapted. And that raises a more interesting question, perhaps, which is why is it that this two-hour protocol really works if you do it once a week to increase growth hormone? It's because it's a stressor, and certain stressors increase growth hormone. Does it have to be heat? No. You could probably also do four really long rounds of ice bath, and I'm guessing you'd probably see a similar effect. No one's ever really looked. 
probably see a similar effect because it's all about the stress stimulus. Now, those that work on exercise science and weight training would probably say, yeah, you could also do a, this has been shown, you know, a 90 minute, 10 sets of 10, multiple exercises for 10 sets of 10, high volume, German volume training, workout and get the same growth hormone effects. There's so many studies like this. I personally like to do the sauna two or three days a week. And if I'm traveling off and don't get the opportunity, if I'm in Austin, it's great because there are all these sauna places. But if I'm traveling abroad, I don't have the time, then I might do, I might take a day. I'm thinking, wow, I did three podcasts. I'm exhausted. When I'm in New York, I like to go to a place. I have no relation to them, but I think it's called Spa 88. It's a Russian banya. And I'll just go for the whole day. If I've been working really, really hard, they serve food there. They serve borscht and all this other kind of like pickled vegetables. And um, they must think that you're Russian. You, they must. You must walk through the doors and they go, "Hello, brother." Sometimes I usually just don't. The best way to to appear Russian, Lex. I hope you're listening. Is to just not say anything. Just, just to nod. That's the most Russian thing stoic. that you can say is nothing. <laughs> exactly. Hilarious. Very stoic. Um, that place is great, and they have different saunas, steam sauna. They have cold dunk, and sometimes I'll just spend three, four hours there. There's one in San Francisco called Archimedes Banya. So sometimes that's an occasional thing. Now, most people are trying to incorporate this into their daily life. And just like, as we said, for ice bath, if you don't have access to ice or ice bath or cold tub, you do cold shower or longer cool baths. With heat, I realize not everyone has access to a sauna. Hot baths do work. Now, one thing about hot baths and hot sauna is they will nuke your sperm. It's not nuke. A nuke is a, you know, is a slang. <laughs> they will reduce viable sperm count. So for males that are trying to re reproduce, you know, trying to create children, you want to be careful about hot baths and hot sauna too often. Some people will bring a cold pack in and put it in their groin. You can't do that in a bath. <laughs> but it's, it, I mean, sperm are maintained outside the body. The testicles are maintained outside the body. For a reason. Um, yeah. Right. The scrotum has varying elasticity in order to maintain temperature of the sperm. That's why that, it, that's the, the various effects that have been described are there on purpose. Um, so why human evolution designed this way, I don't know. Someone will say. But in any case, it, unless you're trying to, you know, and, there, and again, the ice pack approach is interesting. Um, some people mm -hmm. do that. Actually, there's a, a kind of interesting relationship between cold and testosterone and, thermoge and spermatogenesis. There is a little cottage industry out there. I think on Amazon, people will buy these gel pack underwear of, cool, I think they're called snowballs. This is co cooling the scrotum in order to try and increase spermatogenesis. Okay. Now, I'm not aware of any data on this, but people report anic data and have shown their blood work and stuff that it it actually works to increase testosterone levels. I am not aware of any peer you reviewed studies. Now? I am not. I'm not. <laughs> I would not be sitting as comfortably as I am right now. <laughs> but but I find this sort of amusing in, on the one hand, and then on the other hand, I think what we're arriving at is some general principles of physiology, which are that light, exercise, temperature, both heat and cold, are all very powerful stimuli for creating hormonal and neuromodulator dopamine epinephrine effects. And when you start to dig beneath the surface of all these protocols, Wim Hof breathing, ice baths, sauna, um, snowballs, what you are finding is that these are all different stimuli to tap into these different neuromodulator systems, right? You know, sunlight on our skin and on and into our eyes organizes all these hormone cycles. There's a beautiful study out of uh, Israel just this last year, peer-reviewed study showing that if men and women are told to go outside and get a lot of sunlight exposure on their skin for 20 minutes a day, three times a week, testosterone and estrogen levels go up substantially. Feelings of desire and sexual passion go up. You know, there's a real effect of the summer months for people. And it's hormonal, and that's because the skin is an endocrine organ. Um, th these effects shouldn't surprise us. And some people hear these and they go, oh, so basically you're just telling us to like get sunlight and exercise and eat well and, you know, and avoid bright lights at night so that you can sleep. It. Yeah, that's basically what we're saying. We're saying that because there's now substantial physiology to support that. There's nothing new in terms of the mechanisms. The mechanisms haven't evolved in, we believe, hundreds of thousands of years, if not more. The ways to tap into these systems are many. High intensity interval training, you're gonna get increase in adrenaline. Yoga nidra, meditation, a nap, you're gonna get increases in serotonin. So it's not trivial though. I wanna be really clear. These sorts of things are not trivial. They are exceedingly powerful because they tap into systems that we all harbor. So the beautiful thing is they work the first time and they work every time. 
And there are very few things you can say that about. They work the first time and they work every time. And the reasons they work are now becoming clear to us through these more high quality studies. There's a lot of conversations at the moment around concerns for the um, average amount of testosterone that men have got, estrogens in the water and stuff like that. Should we be worried? How, that, how worried should we be? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, I just recently came back from Copenhagen. I was there to give a talk for the Lundbeck Foundation and there was another talk that the Lundbeck Foundation put on. They do a great popular science series um, called Coffee and Cocktails. I'm not a drinker, but people, it's so European. It's, it's so different than over here. In was the everybody States. smoking outside? No one was smoking, but people would bring, were allowed to bring in real glasses with ice in them. And yet the auditorium was silent. This was a big concert. It's in the concert hall in Copenhagen. It's a very beautiful venue. And you couldn't hear an ice cube chink the entire night. No clink, clink, clink. No, no chinking of the ice cubes. People were in there with their cocktails and enjoying, enjoying science. And earlier that week, there was a talk by uh, Dr. Shana Swan. She wrote a book called Countdown. Uh, she went on Joe Rogan's podcast, um, I believe earlier last year. And she talked about the decline of sperm counts from the 1930s until now and ties it in a very, re she's a serious researcher with National Institutes of Health grants, et cetera, ties this to um, the increasing presence of phthalates, the most difficult word to pronounce in the English language besides ophthalmology, phthalates that are present, main, present mainly in pesticides. If you look at sperm counts and testosterone levels in males in different areas of the United States, they are significantly lower in areas where there's a lot of pesticide use, in rural areas where there's a lot of farming and pesticides. Very serious issue. And in the offspring of mothers that ingest phthalates, there's this, the anogenital distance is what they study in the lab. The what? The anogenital distance, literally the distance between the base of the scrotum and the, um, and the anus in males is much greater than it is in females. I can't believe females that there's a word for that. Females don't have a scrotum, obviously, so they measure from the base of the genitals to the base of the vagina to the, to the anus. In males, they go from the base of the scrotum. It depends on the study. Sometimes it's the top of the scrotum. Um, you know, I always say, you know, uh, you always have to be careful when people are measuring anything related to genitalia because somebody's going <laughs> to cheat in the measurement. So, um, so in any event, I don't know how they controlled for that, but she shows these remarkable pictures in mice and in humans of people that are exposed or mice that are exposed to phthalates. And basically males are showing the more female-like pattern of of anogenital distance when they're exposed to these phthalates in utero. Okay, this is not post-birth. This is in utero. The mother's being exposed. It crosses the blood placental barrier. What's happening? Well, this is reducing sperm counts. Now, what can people do about this? Well, first of all, there's this question of whether or not phthalates are having a similar effect after a child is brought into the world. One doesn't know, but we do know, and this is, goes back to my early graduate work was on the effects of androgens like testosterone and DHT on different traits of brain and body. We know that, for instance, it just very briefly that, that during pregnancy, the brain is organized male by way of, believe it or not, testosterone converted to estrogen through a process called aromatization. But the growth of the penis, the fact that there even will be a penis, et cetera, is set by a, a testosterone called DHT, dihydrotestosterone. Testosterone converted DHT through 5-alpha reductase and on and on and on. That's an organizing effect on the system, as they call it. But then there's an activating effect where during puberty, the testes just start producing testosterone. Some is converted to DHT, and the DHT is what creates the growth of the penis. Okay? In people that inject phthalates during puberty and in the post-puberty years, it's conceivable that those phthalates could inhibit the activating effects of androgens, not just what we call the organizing effects of androgens early in life. Okay, why is this interesting and important? Well, sperm counts are definitely going down. Are they going down so much so that people are incapable of reproducing? Probably not because, you know, as they told us in school, it just takes one and indeed it just takes one sperm, but it is a probability, it's a numbers game, right? The reason, you know, I, people that take anabolic steroids, unless they do things to offset the effect on their own testosterone and sperm production, sperm counts are down. So the probability of, of successful insemination is of, of the egg is reduced also. It's a numbers game. So it just takes one, but having many improves the probability that the one will be able to fertilize. So the short answer is yes, I think it is 
very concerning. Now, which things should we be concerned about? My understanding of the literature, and here I'm not an I'm now venturing to territory for which I'm certainly not an expert, is that things like plastics that have BPAs may be a concern. Drinking water may be a concern, but the most serious or enriched source of BPAs are things like printed receipts. I was out for dinner the other night. It was probably about a month and a half ago, and the server came over and I reached for the receipt. And as I was going for it like this, one of the girls who I'd never met before, she's a creator online, hit my hand away. I was like, are you really going to touch that? And this is the first time I've ever heard about this. Yeah. This is legit. Yeah, printed receipts are are a a, a rich source of BPAs. And um, topically, that could come through the yeah, skin? Yeah, it could go transdermally. I mean, now, you'd probably have to handle a lot of receipts. I mean, I don't think you're going to if you're a checkout cashier, perhaps, this would be the cash- sort of thing. Definitely checkout cashiers. And listen, it, it's going to vary. Some people are operating with a testosterone level and sperm count that's already back on its heels, so yes. to speak. Some people have abundant testosterone and sperm. So it is really gonna depend on the individual. I don't think people should get paranoid or delusional about any of this. But just don't start sleeping in a bed of receipts. Don't start sleeping in a bed of receipts. That's an interesting, and there are all sorts of jokes that could be made about that <laughs> one um, that I won't make. But there, there are also some other things like, you know, do a little bit of online research about phthalates and don't go to fringe sites. Go to Dr. Shana Swan's website, right? I believe she's at Mount Sinai or one of the other larger medical schools in New York. Go to her website. She's a legitimate researcher and see what's there. See what the sources of phthalates are. Pesticides. Does that mean you should only eat organic fruits and vegetables? Maybe. I don't know which pesticides people are using on which fruits and vegetables, right? So there's some research that needs to be done. But the moment we start talking this way and people start saying, oh, wow, this is really like hippie science. This isn't hippie science. This is serious NIH funded researcher saying phthalates before birth can dramatically alter the trajectory of, of the male's ability to make sperm and testosterone. Phthalates in puberty may be able to do that, but we know that, that androgens, in particular DHT and testosterone converted to estrogen have a powerful role in masculinizing the brain and body during those years. Why wouldn't people be, you know, do half an hour of research online? Or for instance, the abundant data that melatonin suppresses pregnant, uh, excuse me, suppresses puberty. And yet people will take melatonin like it was, you know, insane, th- insane super levels. physiological levels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I saying melatonin is going to suppress your puberty? If you took it as a kid, you're messed up. No. And yet it's very easy to replace it with some of the healthier alternatives that are out there. So I think that one can have a, a thoughtfulness about this stuff and it's, um, and it's action oriented without having to really freak out about it. How do you think that creators like Derek from More Plates, More Dates or or Greg Doucette or someone has changed the way that the internet understands um, hormonal profiles and supplementation? Because since watching a lot of Derek's stuff, since he's become big on YouTube, I have been much more considering the balance that's inside of my body. But I don't don't think that that was super common before guys like him were around. Yeah. Look, Derek's not a scientist by training, but he's done an immense service to the world because no one was talking about this stuff. It was talked about in bodybuilding circles where they talk very openly. It was starting to emerge in testosterone replacement therapy clinics. And then mostly guys were doing this stuff and lying about it, right? They're doing it, but then they don't want to talk about it. Actually, kudos to Joe Rogan, who years ago came out and said, yeah, he decided to start doing TRT and low dose of testosterone. He's already successfully reproduced. And so he, you know, he brought it up and, and, you know, It's clear that this is becoming more common. Here here are some of the general principles that I think, uh, forgive me, Derek, if I get this wrong in terms of what you believe, because I never want to speak for anybody else, but my read of the science and the actual protocols speak to the idea that many people do not need testosterone replacement. Young guys should really avoid doing anabolic steroids. It can really mess up their system, not just physically, not just for the ability to have kids later, but um, get, lead to all sorts of sexual issues and sexual performance issues. Like there needs to be some medical incentive, right? Hypogonadism, for instance. But at the point where someone either has banked sperm or decides they don't want any more kids or is willing to do something like take HCG to maintain testicular and uh, function and spermatogenesis, it's very clear that going with the lowest you know, doctor described, right? I'm not talking about illicit use that the lowest possible dosage of testosterone therapy is going to be better than, t- for instance, taking 200 milligrams 
in a one mil injection every two weeks, right? Because you get these huge increases and then these troughs. So people Is this are, something that you've learned from Derek? Yes, and in talking with other people. And I, I'm no longer doing this, um, but I, I did a run of it from 45 to, to 46 years old and nothing before that. Um, and I did it because I'm working on a, on a book really that has a whole section on hormone therapies. I wanted to see what it was like. I'll tell you, basically testosterone gives you more energy to work more. Um, if it's done appropriately, right? Maybe that's the, yeah. the secret for Lex. Maybe, maybe Lex homo makes, is just brimming. Maybe he's brimming. And I'll say when I went into it, my, my levels were mid-range. They were fine. High to mid-range. They were kind of like sevens, eights. But I was doing some supplementation to support that. I've since gone back to that. It was funny. When you say something on the internet, people think that means it's forever, right? I, it is possible to start and come off, right? So, so what I've done. And, and so here's what's, what's relevant here. People are now spacing out, you know, 30 milligrams on Monday, 30 milligrams on Wednesday, 30 milligrams on Friday is like kind of a low reasonable dose. Again, talk to your doctor. These aren't recommended dosages. That's more typical. Another thing that's really important is that people have traditionally blocked estrogen by increases while doing this by taking an aromatase inhibitor, Nolvidex, Arimidex, these kinds of things. That almost often is a bad idea, almost often, because having enough estrogen around allows you to maintain cognitive function and libido. A lot of guys think it's just, you know, and it is true if estrogen is very high and testosterone is very low, it could, libido can suffer. But if testosterone is very high and estrogen is very low, libido can really suffer. So a lot of people who are crushing their estrogen realize that by coming off some of those drugs, they feel far better, far Interesting. better, far better. So most people I know that are doing this are taking low doses of testosterone semi-frequently throughout the week. 20 to 30 milligrams every other day or so. There's a lot of variation around this. And then not doing anything to reduce uh, aromatase, or if they are taking very low doses, not one milligram of arimidex, but maybe something like 0.1 milligrams of arimidex every third day or so. Again, not a recommendation. Talk yeah, yeah. to your doctor. The, the smarter clinics are starting to think about this. And actually, I don't have any financial relationship to Derek or to Merrick Health, which is his clinic, but from what I understand, they do a very good job. I did help them design a herbal, mostly herbal supplement for testosterone support for people who are not on TRT as things like Tonga, Ali, Fidoja. But unbeknownst to most people, I, I've not made one penny on that. That was just based on a conversation of the research with him and Dr. Kyle Gillette and a few other people. So estrogen can help maintain libido also, can increase libido. Now, here's something I learned that's really interesting from Peter Atia recently. Women, as we know, make both testosterone and estrogen, and of course, a bunch of other uh, hormones too. If they get their blood work back and you were to adjust the units that those hormones are measured in, nanograms per deciliter in some cases, picograms per deciliter in other cases, if you normalize them all to the same nanograms per deciliter, you would find that a healthy woman has more testosterone than she does estrogen. That's right. I asked him this three times. I'm like, you're telling me that women have more testosterone circulating in them than estrogen. He said, absolutely. Now this, maybe there's a, there's a caveat to that during some phase of the menstrual cycle, but that does not mean that their testosterone levels are higher than that of men. But this is remarkable, right? This means that these androgens, testosterone and, and are doing interesting things in men and in women and estrogen, as we just described, are doing really interesting things, certainly in women and in men. So this idea of more testosterone, less estrogen good is always the case. That's simply false. You have to think about whether or not it's a man, whether or not it's a woman, whether or not the goal is more or less, typically people aren't going for less libido, but I suppose it's possible. Some people out there with that. Some people might be highly distracted by an excessive libido, right? That's a different story. but. And then, of course, DHT. So I think one of the things that Derek has really contributed to the world, and I think is important for people to know, that a lot of the drugs that are used to treat hair loss, finasteride, Propecia, things like that, block DHT receptors, dihydrotestosterone. DHT is responsible for beard growth in the face and for balding, male pattern baldness. People, because they want their hair, will take these drugs. If they take it them in pill form, they're blocking DHT everywhere and they can experience severe defects in libido and sexual performance. 
Now, before that... It's a choice between your hair and your erection. For a lot of people, it is, right? I mean, for now, there are now topical things, and Derek talks about all this kind of thing. There are topical solutions. He went really, solution. really deep. He goes that. really deep into all this. And what's interesting is, you know, we also can take a step back and say, like, what's the landscape of health information that created this opportunity for a kid in his 20s? By the way, no one knows his last name. Very clever. No one knows his last name. Um, I'll play Derek. It's kind of an avatar of a human, right? <laughs> Although he's real. Um, what created this landscape for this guy to be able to get this information out there, even though he's not a physician, he's not a scientist? And I think what it is is that he saw that there was all this information nested in these very niche communities that no, most people don't want to look like a bodybuilder, yeah. right? And yet what he did was he sort of normalized the discussion about hormones. He normalized the discussion about other things like dopamine and cortisol etc. And what's interesting is that science now is kind of following suit. You know, 10 years ago, a discussion about hormone therapies would never come up in the hallways of, of discussions with my colleagues. Since doing a, an episode of the podcast on optimizing testosterone and estrogen, no fewer than 10 of, I'm not going to name names, but these are serious scientists, and it's a mixture of men and women, have approached me about like, hey, like, what can one do in order to adjust testosterone or estrogen levels? Is um, estrogen therapy for menopause, a useful thing. When should one start? Now, I'm not an endocrinologist, so all I can do is point them in the way of information, but this is an important area, and here's why. Hormones control neuromodulators like dopamine, estrogen, and so on, and those neuromodulators powerfully influence our states of mind. So if your hormones are out of whack, your neuromodulators are going to be out of whack. Typically, the treatment for depression would be to go in and just give a serotonin reuptake inhibitor or well, butrin type dopamine thing. Now, that has its use, but I love this trend now, not towards hormone therapy necessarily, but just toward a thinking, a mindset of how deep in the layers of my biology can I go to create these sort of waves of health that rise up to the level of ability to focus and et cetera. For so many years, it's all been attacked at the surface, kind of the waves uh, on the surface of the ocean. And yet there's this like, we're now talking about the deep tectonic plates movements that are affecting all that in any case. Around about 30 years ago, you took a real hard turn in life. It seemed like you drastically altered the trajectory that you were moving on for quite a while. And I'm very interested in how anybody manages to make severe life changes like that. I think that many people can, they believe that they have control over maybe their daily habits and, and little things here and there, but they don't have huge global control over their life direction, certainly not in the way that they want Reflecting on that now, does it almost surprise you, sort of the ability that you have to be able to change that direction? It seems so unbelievably rare. Uh, right. So it, um, I don't know. Um, I like to think everybody harbors it inside themselves. I I can say without going into the whole backstory because I've done it before. I mean, at, at 19, I basically just looked at myself and decided that I was a loser, right? I mean, I was able-bodied, which was helpful. I had a mind that could remember things, which was helpful. I was interested in a few things, but none of those things were setting me up for career or ongoing progress. And I had a lot of maladaptive behaviors, right? At the time I was getting involved in fighting. I just, I just didn't, I wasn't completing my schoolwork. I was just really in a bad place. And it was really fear and desperation, um, mostly fear that inspired the, the switch. Along the way, I, I haven't talked about this publicly you know, to any great extent, but along the way I hit numerous roadblocks again and again. Sometimes they were situational, like people close to me dying and the grief that came with that. Sometimes it was my own kind of um, feeling like I was getting pulled back toward uh, a state of mind that wasn't healthy for me uh, and so on. But I think what I've been good at at least good at, not great at, but at least good at, is finding really good mentors that would allow me to get to the next node, of the next milestone. And I should say that some of those mentors were real people that I, I didn't say, can you be my mentor? Um, not that that would be a bad thing, but really tried to model my behavior after people that I respected. And sometimes those mentors were people that I didn't know at all. I mean, I'll just say this right now. I'd, I mean, I'm going to embarrass him by saying it, but you know, I was a junior professor, meaning be, before I got tenure, running a lab. I had a, a bulldog puppy, a laboratory, and a home for the first time in my life, and feeling very, very overwhelmed and distraught. And I made 
many of the things that I heard Tim Ferriss say sort of central to my way of doing things. I didn't go four hours of work a week, but I did start to get extreme about organizing my schedule. So he was a big influence on you, Tim? Huge, huge. And, and you know, I know Tim a little bit. We have some common friends and I feel very fortunate that now we're in touch because i gone on his podcast and gotten to know one another, but just huge. I mean, like there were no organizational forces in my life for me at that time that could help me navigate through this landscape of, you know, I'd never been a professor before. I had taught it now. This was many years ago now, but um, I knew how to do science. I felt confident in my ability to take an empty room and a budget and create, buy the right equipment and do the experiments, hire the people. I had no problem with that, but how to um, regulate my time and my energy and how to um, communicate with people. I mean, he had these like little things that I don't like the word hacks. I hate it because hacks are, implies that you're using something for a purpose that it wasn't intended for. That's a hack. But he had things like, instead of asking people, um, you know, like what's up when they come in your office, asking them, you know, what specifically, you know, what, what can I do for you? Like, what do you need? Right. Really cutting to the chase because time became a valuable resource. Little things like that, tiny things on the fit, on the surface that translate into huge conversion in terms of time and energy. Um, and even just setting aside some savings and things. I, I, it's not that I'm not dumb about money, but I wasn't, I've never really taken the time to think about how I was going to invest money or do anything. So Tim did a tremendous service for, for me uh, without realizing it. And I've thanked him now a million times. I'm going to thank him a million times. I'm thanking you. Thank you, Tim. I'm thanking you again. Things like that. So selecting mentors. Then eventually when it came time to start podcasting, I mean, Lex, whether or not he knows or not, you know, just thinking, oh, here's another guy who's a, he's a scientist. He's MIT. The fact that he always wore that suit, I thought I'm going to copy him and just always wear the same thing because I don't have to take the guesswork. I can take the guesswork out of it. There were little things that were super deliberate that just saved me time and energy. And I think that that's helped me along the way. And then the other thing is I have really tried to adopt this idea that when it's inevitable and it will inevitably arrive, that stress grows us that it really sharpens decision-making. It really sharpens decision-making. And you know, if you have a very stressful event and then you recover from it, the worst thing to do is just go and keep going. You need to take some time and reflect about what led into that. So I've, I think I'm very good at leveraging fear into positive change. If I really think about most of the major shifts in my life, it was, I'm scared as hell to remain in this situation. And I'm very good at broadcasting fear into my future. Uh, you know, if I've ever been in a, bad relationship. It was clearly if I stayed in, it couldn't have been so bad that I felt like I had to leave. So I would broadcast and project, you know, how horrible it would be for my future children. And I might even build that up a little bit in my system. Now one could say, well, maybe you could have navigated it successfully. I'm better at projecting fear into my future. And that has led me to make, I think, better and better decisions over time. That's it. How much of the old Andrew still rises to the surface today i know that the music that you tend to listen to when you're training is still pretty punky <laughs> and when i work yeah i mean i have two very polarized versions of music i do love you know i love bob dylan i love joe strummer acoustic i like i like, you know i like melodic music too but yeah I'll, i'm listening to rancid stiff little fingers i mean i'm i mean i own the first ever gig i went to stiff, stiff little, little fingers, fingers i'm jealous i've never actually seen them play live i'm a huge stiff little fingers fan yeah. huge stiff little fingers fan um huge against me fan, huge rancid fan. I mean, you know, for people that, um, of my generation, they probably remember it. For people who are younger probably think, oh, that's all nineties stuff. But a lot to me, I mean, I have huge collections of like eighties and nineties music, seventies music, second wave punk, third wave punk. I collect a ton of that stuff. I love it. I mean, how much of me still exists? I believe that we are all born fundamentally with some gift and it's our job to reveal that gift to ourselves. And, you know, here I'm, I want to thoroughly acknowledge someone else who's been a great mentor without ever meeting him is like Robert Green, I think is a, is a wonderful, fantastic guy. Fantastic. I've never met you, Robert, but I'd love to meet. I mean, it's, it's one of these things where I, I used put to put you in touch. He's been on the show twice. Amazing. I used to suggest the book mastery to, to graduate students and to undergraduates, like, you know, learn the, this process of finding a mentor. Um, and in science, we have natural mentors, graduate advisors and postdoc advisors. And I, I made sure, I will say this, I should have said this earlier, when a mentor has sort of arrived in my life, either virtually or in reality, I make the most of that relationship. I really nurture those relationships. I mean, I still go to visit the children of my dead graduates 
advisor kids, you know, because I care. So, I mean, these are like, these people are like family to me. How much of it still exists? Well, the energy has always been the same. The energy is I have an absolute obsession from day one. This maybe was what I was kind of born with to, I like to learn things and share them with the world. I was six years old giving lectures on Monday after reading about medieval weapons or, you know, goldfish biology in class. I mean, my parents were, thought I was crazy and they took me a psychiatrist and they're like, no, he just really likes learning and really likes telling people about that, about what he learns. So, and I had a little bit of an underlying Tourette's when I was younger, I had a grunting tick. <clears throat> I had a little, and when I'm tired, it sometimes emerges a little bit. And for me, learning and kind of seeking kind of calms that somehow, as does training, um, as does skateboarding. I did boxing, of course, head damage isn't good, so I stopped boxing. But that's always been in me. That's how I'm, that's how my nervous system kind of tilts left in that way. The energy, I would say I'm able to turn the dial. I'm able to tap into kind of some old hurts and angers as fuel, but I really try and orient towards things in a very Lex Friedman-ish way from a place of like love. Show them love. Show them, show them, do things from a place of love because it's a more continual resource really believe it's this dopamine epinephrine cycle, positive feedback cycle. I really do. And so that's all there. Um, you know, I have pretty much eaten the same way I have since college. I really, I haven't really changed the way I eat that much. I mean, I probably ate more junk every once in a while, ice cream and pizza and stuff. And now I have less of an appetite for it, but I, I still am the same. I still train every other day. I, um, I love music. I love movies. I love nature. I love the flora and fauna of life. I mean, I have this kind of obsession with fish tanks, freshwater fish tanks. I love, um, and listen, I, I, my ex-girlfriend is a, uh, she's a florist. I, I, I developed a love of flowers, you know, in those years. Um, I love, you know, I, I, I'm probably the one guy who was like wandering around in college. I would go to these like orchid festivals and some of them look like aliens. And I just, I just love learning and I love digesting novel information. And, um, and now, you know, I, I have to say I'm in a place where the people that I'm closest to, I mean, thankfully really kind of support that and I can indulge it through podcasting. It's so lovely now that the environment of curiosity, I think that podcasts and, and YouTube and creators have engendered. It's so cool. You know, the, the fact that you get to find out about something that you really care, that you would have done, right? You would have done it mm -hmm. for free mm -hmm. without anybody else knowing about it. Right. And then somehow telling other people the thing that you found out in this version of the simulation is called a, a, a job or a pursuit or something. It's, right. it's wild. Uh, another thing that has carried over from your youth are your tattoos, <laughs> yeah. which I've heard you talk about, but never seen. What's your relationship with your tattoos and why has no one ever seen them? Yeah. Um, yeah, actually it was Tim Ferriss that outed me on this one. He was like, oh, I found a picture on the internet with you in full sleeves. Um, yeah, you know, I believe that, you know, tattoos are, I mean, this has come as no surprise or a literal expression of what we feel on the inside. And, you know, I, and I'm not recommending this. Kids don't do this. I started getting tattooed really young. How young? About 14, I got my first tattoo. No way. We did them ourselves. With India. Your first one was please yourself? Please don't, no, please no one do this. India ink and a needle. And um, we used to do these. It was really bad. They're called knick-knack tattoos, or we kind of would do this at home. Don't do it. It's really bad. You get bad infections. They're ugly. They, they, they blur. They bleed. It's not good. Um, yeah, I started getting tattooed. I, when I was a kid and growing up skateboarding in the punk rock scene, there were these guys in, um, in the town where I lived. They called themselves the Yahtzee guys. I don't know why. I don't know what that was about. But they all had full sleeves, and they were super nice guys, and they were all into skateboarding and you know, and vehicles. And I just looked up to these guys. I thought, Oh, like someday I want full sleeves. I, yeah, I've, I've got full sleeves. I'm basically like neck to neck to wrist. So you know? chest piece as well. Yeah. But yeah, back's covered. Uh, back's covered. Yeah. Nothing on my legs, nothing on my stomach ribs. Yeah. Yeah. The tops of my tops of my shoulders. And, um, I got a big picture of Costello, my dog back there. I've got yep. a picture of his paw back there. I've got a picture of another dog I used to have. Um, there's still some space for a few things. There's some things very personal to me. Um, Is that the reason that you prefer not to show them? Yeah, you know, I think that there are a couple reasons. I'll, I'll just be clear as to why. First of all, um, when I show up to podcast, it's the same way I show up to lecture in the um, classroom auditorium. And I swear on my life, this is my mindset and this is my mantra when I do it. I'm there to teach. It's not about me. It's about the student. It's about the people learning. 
I don't want it ever to be about me. I don't want the focus to be on me. I mean, obviously I'm the voice and the person talking, but I really want people to internalize the information. And I do think that the tattoos, because they have nothing to do with the information, are a distraction. They're just a distraction. I, I don't know, it would sort of like be wearing like a bright yellow shirt or something. It's not my style. I prefer to kind of make myself disappear as much as I can um, and let the information come forward. That's, you know, even when I gave scientific lectures, which I still do, of course, for my, my professor job, I generally liked the room to be pretty dark and I wanted the light to be on the data on the slides. I was happy to be the voice, but I want people thinking about the data. So podcasting is a little different. So you come through as a voice, not we're on YouTube, a voice and an image, but I really prefer that it not be about me. Now there's a human element too. And I think things have changed a lot. When I was growing up, tattoos were not accepted. There are many work environments where if you have, for instance, where people prefer that their surgeon or their doctor not have tattoos. Some people might prefer their surgeon or doctor have tattoos. When I was growing up, if you had a, uh, I never had one, but if someone had a nose ring, they had to cover it up with a Band-Aid or take it out if they worked at the coffee shop. Remember that? You probably don't, you're probably young enough. No. Or, the, or eyebrow ring. Think, trends have changed, right? Yep. Things have changed. And I'm kind of old school because I'm kind of old now, 46. Um, and the etiquette for me has always been to, you know, and this is Lex does this too, is I, I personally find that if I can just show up as formal and consistent as possible, that people will at least know that I'm taking them seriously. So I don't really do it for me. I pretty much do it for the audience. Um, and also none of the tattoos are like that interesting. It's my dog. I've, I really like raptors. I've got a bunch of birds. I've got, I mean, I have all sorts of different things. Like raptors uh, like the dinosaur. No, raptors like um, red-tailed hawks and blue, you know, I like birds right. and things I, like that. I had either dinosaurs or trucks. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, you really need to love Ford Raptors. No, no, no Ford Raptor. I, dr I drive a Toyota 4Runner and I love it. I've got one truck and I love that thing. Um, although with gas right now, I mean, it's, you kind of got to wonder about having a gas-driven vehicle like a 4Runner. In any case, yeah, the tattoo thing, I would say for, for younger people coming up, just be aware that you can't control other people's perceptions either. And so, you know, I always made it a point that I didn't want things on my knuckles. I didn't want them on my hands. I didn't want them on my neck. I didn't want them on my face. Do I judge people when they have them? No. But do I want them for me? No. I also think that this is very neuroscience-y as neuroscientists that we have dedicated brain areas called fusiform gyrus. It's a face area that's dedicated to the processing of faces. Even if I just put two dots and a line in between them on a piece of paper, you see that as a face. When one puts a tattoo on their throat or on their face, it actually changes the way that the face is perceived, right? I mean, it almost looks like another mouth there, right? It's a very different look. It's, it can be a little bit jarring. I'm not saying one shouldn't have it, but it can be a little bit jarring. It's, it changes the look of the person forever. It's not just that it's above the neckline. It's that it kind of competes with the processing of their face in its normal way. And so for me, whenever I see somebody with a throat tattoo or a face tattoo, it's sort of like it's hard to kind of orient around that. And I think there's some biology to, uh, to, that relates to that. But look, when it comes down to it, I mean, you, people need to be individuals and live their life the way they want to live their life. I've also never been that much of an iconoclast. I'm not, you know, I'm... It, I grew up in the punk rock thing. Um, you know, I hate in-group, out-group stuff. I always had friends from a lot of different, you know, friends that are jocks and hippies and punk rockers and, you know, straight and gay. And like, I don't care as long as people are living their best life and they're not harming anybody. Like, I'm like, great, go for it. I, I'm very laid back in that way. Of course, if people are harming other people, then I believe that like li liberty back. and independent freedom, I mean, liberty is, you know, one of the highest things, you know, for me. So, but I don't tend to, I'm, I don't consider myself a very judgmental person, but you can't always control the perceptions of others. So I would just think people should be thoughtful about what they want to accomplish in life in terms of a life mission and just ask whether or not some of the permanent cosmetic changes they might make might, might align with, compete with, or be neutral for those life missions. My life mission is very simple. I want to teach people the beauty and the utility of biology. I'm going to do that today. I'm going to do that until I take my last breath in one form or another, because that's what excites me. And that's like what keeps the dopamine cranking. Dudes, let's bring this one home. Look, I really, really appreciate you. Uh, the work that you've done, the fact that I feel like I have a lot more agency over my life because I understand that my internal processes are something that I can influence. You know, the first time that I heard you say that you cannot control the mind with the mind, a lot of different things clicked for me. So I'm very glad that Lex bullied you or convinced you to start doing your show. And uh, 
yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing a lot more of what you've got to do in the future. Well, thanks so much. And thanks for bringing me on today. I, obviously, uh, we've been in touch and uh, I uh, align with you and I feel resonance along the, the life as podcaster, right? But also we've had a chance to interact a few times. I'm looking forward to more because I think what you're doing, bringing knowledge to the world is is so important. And I so appreciate your your questions and learning from you. I'm also going to get these resources about the expectation effect and the rest. I've been taking notes here because I, uh, I'm obsessed with learning. So where should people you. go? People want to make sure that they, they listen to more, watch more, follow more of your stuff. Where should they go? Thanks for asking. Yeah, it's uh, very straightforward. It's Huberman Lab is the podcast and it's all the standard places, YouTube, Apple, Spotify, etc. Huberman Lab on Twitter, Huberman Lab on Instagram and the Twitter and Instagram mainly are short content. I used to do a lot more hand drawings and kind of I think you're classroom. doing Instagram pretty much as well as any science communicator that I've seen. I don't think there's anyone else that's optimized it better than that. Thanks. Right now. Thanks. Yeah, I try and answer comments and respond to things and um, any of those three places. And we have a website, which is HubermanLab.com, there, where all the podcast episodes are, links to all things in all formats. We have a newsletter and, you know, people can peruse that if they want. It's all, I should say, zero cost to access. So that's been a major goal that we've stuck to, which is to just, we don't put anything behind a paywall. The information that's there is the information that anyone can access. Dude, I appreciate you. Let's go and get hot and cold. Let's do it. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.